All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this regular meeting of the West Covina Planning Commission here in the City Council Chambers, July 23rd, 2019, at about 7.02 p.m. We will begin tonight by rising for a moment of silent prayer or meditation, which will be immediately followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Commissioner Jaquez. So let's rise for the moment of whatever you want to do. All right, Mr. Anderson, roll call, please. Commissioner Holtz? Here. Commissioner Hing? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Jaquez? Here. And Chairman Redholz? Here. Okay, next item is approval of minutes. Does anyone have any changes to the minutes? I may have one. <laughs> and I may need some maybe another commissioner or two to in, uh, back up my memory but on the um, the Cedarwood Street house you know in the minutes it talks about the representative Mr. Fong was asked to encourage the property owner to contact her neighbors I, I remember that but I also remember that we encouraged him to ask the owner to be if she could be present at the next meeting, uh, and I believe that's true, right? Yes, that is true. So I would like the minutes to reflect that. Okay, we, we can. Can uh, we do we that? Can, yeah, we can add that. Okay. okay. Otherwise, we're fine. So the minutes are uh, approved as amended. The next item is oral communications. This would be the time for any member of the public to address the Planning Commission on any item that is not on the agenda that uh, falls within the purview. I have no cards for that. Is anyone here wishing to speak on a non-agenda item? Seeing none, we will move on. We have two public hearings tonight. The first one is item number two, which is an administrative use permit an AUP with the following numbers, 19-25, 19-26, 27, 28, and 29, categorical exemption. The applicant is Crown Castle Fiber, LLC, represented, I believe, by Cynthia Denise Holmes. The location is the public right-of-way with, near, or in front of the following addresses, 1631 East Nanette Avenue, 2539 Temple Avenue, 1689 Natalie Avenue, 2634 Temple Avenue, 1722 Natalie Avenue, and these are all S Southern California Edison uh, polls. Mr. Anderson, the staff report will be presented by whom? Our planning manager, Joanne Burns, will be presenting that report. Great, thank you. Good evening, pl planning commissioners and members of the public. The, the, um, for this particular item, the Planning Commission's purview is to review the aesthetics of the proposed small wireless facility. Since the application and design of all five administra administrative use permit plans are identical, staff has consolidated the discussion to a single agenda item to process the applica applications as efficiently as possible. Hearing notices were sent to 447 owners and occupants of properties within 300 feet from the proposed small wireless facilities. Staff did receive two phone calls with general inquiries regarding the proposal. Um, the, the, um, the two people who called staff um, inquiring about the proposal did not identify whether or not they're opposed um, or for the, the, the project. 
staff did receive one email in opposition of the project. That email has been um, placed in front of the planning commissioners um, prior to the beginning of the meeting. I'll go ahead and continue um, and discuss the location. Um, Crown Castle is proposing to install five small wireless facilities in the public right of way to service T-Mobile customers in the southwest portion of West Covina. Um, um, largely, these five small wireless facilities are located on the east side of Azusa Avenue near Amar, Amar Road. I'll go ahead and go over the location of each one. Um, AUP 19-25 is 1631 East Nanette Avenue. The existing light pole and the proposed light poles are located on the north side of the net avenue just north of its t intersection with nina street the existing street light pole that will be de decommissioned and replaced is located approximately 17 feet from the closest multifamily residential um, this multifamily residential is the the fourplex directly north right along this area right over here AUP 19-26, which is here on the map, um, is 2539 Temple Avenue. It is located on the west side of Temple Avenue, approximately 80 feet from its T intersection with East Woodridge Circle. The, the existing street light pole that will be decommissioned and replaced is located approximately 70 feet from the closest resident, um, residence, um, which is the residential, the single family residential home directly across the street along this area right here where the arrow is pointed. Can you show the arrow again? Um, right here. This is the closest residential. Right there. Twenty-six, yes, and it's seventy feet from the closest residential. Single-family residential. Single residential, yes. The the one that's right right in, that it's right in front of these. This is a parking a parking area for the apartment complex. Um, for um, the closest residential um, in the multifamily is is great is about 75 feet. This is about 70 feet. So this is the closer the closer one. And then AUP 19-27 is 1960. I'm sorry, 1689 Natalie Avenue, um, and it's right along here. Um, it is located on the west side of Temple Avenue, approximately 45 feet west of its T intersection with Glenridge Circle. The existing street light pole that will be decommissioned and replaced is approximately 19 feet from the closest residence. Um, the closest residence is this right here. And let's see, AUP 1928, um, which is at the very um, bottom or the furthest south, is located on, is 2634 Temple Avenue. It is located on the west side of Temple Avenue, approximately 45 feet of it. Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I already went over this. For five feet with the, its T intersection with Glendridge Circle, the street light pole that will be decommissioned is replaced 19 feet right along here. It went back, sorry. 
um, 17, um, 1929, um, AUP 1929 is, is 1722 Natalie Avenue. It, it is located on the south side of Natalie Avenue, approximately 180 feet southeast of its T intersection with South Nancy Way, um, with South Nancy Street, which is right along here. The, exi the existing street light pole that will be decommissioned and replaced is approximately 17 feet from the closest residence, which is right, which is the residence that it's, the fourplex that it's right in front of, right along here. Um, these are photographs of the existing light poles. Um, the proposal shows that the existing light poles um, will be um, a minimum of three feet from the proposed light poles, um, with the exception of 2539 Temple Avenue and 1722 Natalie Way as conditioned. Um, this is mainly because 2539 Temple Avenue, uh, when they locate their proposed light pole um, on around in around this area right along here where the, where I'm moving the arrow. Um, it is going to be too close to this driveway um, entering the parking area of the multifamily residential um, uh, complex. Um, and so if they, um, in order to, to locate that, they would have to be a little bit further than three and a half feet, but still within proximity of this light pole. Um, another um, 1722 Natalie Way, um, in order to, for them to be three, three feet away from this existing light pole, they would have to locate the light pole right near the, the, this um, tree in the front. This is a private tree. And um, in order for them to move it out of the drip line as required by the zoning code, it may be located um, further than three feet um, away from the light pole. Keep in mind that the three feet minimum from the existing light pole is a is a uh, is in the design guidelines. Um, so basically, if if it co complies with the design guidelines, then then typically staff recommends approval if it's in a, and would approve it administratively or ministerially. Um, if it does not comply with the design guidelines, then it would be subject to Planning Commission review. Um, although, um, and in addition to that, although all these proposed um, small wireless facilities are within, do not comply with the 100 feet minimum distance requirement from residential, from the, for the residential design guidelines, staff believes that the proposed facilities will not be, significantly change the streetscape because the proposed street light poles will be located um, again, within prox proximity of the existing light poles. Um, the, the design of all five small wireless facilities are almost identical. Uh, the maximum height of the proposed light pole from lowest grade to the top of the radium or shroud is 28 feet 6 inches tall. The existing light pole is 24 feet. So in order, for, um, when they're going to be replacing this light pole, the light pole itself is going to be, the height of the light pole itself is going to be one foot shorter than the existing light pole. Um, and the shroud on top would be five feet six inches tall. Uh, um, according to the, plan, um, to the plans and the proposed um, elevations, the radium, the radium or the shroud would be 24 inches in diameter. However, in the plans, in their details or standards, um, they are proposing it to be 14 feet 6 inches. So there is a condition of approval in all five draft resolutions requiring the, that the shroud be reduced to 4.6 4 inches in diameter, uh, consistent with the details that they've submitted on their plans. Um, reducing the, 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 the diameter of the shroud um, will 
will basically make the shroud appear as if it's part of the light pole and it'll have like a streamline effect. So that the look that we're really going for is, is something like this where the, the shroud um, appears, and the shroud and antenna appears to be a part of this light pole and it will be colored the same as the materials of the right light pole. The proposed materi materials of the light pole would be um, concrete and the white, all wires and cables would be internalized into the light pole. All associated mechanical equipment would be, would be constructed underground and in, in an underground vault. Um, as far as, as condition, as far as the design and also the underground vaulting um, and the wires and cables not being visible, the, um, as condition, it would comply with the design guidelines. The project is not in conflict with the adopted general plan and is consistent with policies 6.24 and 6.25 of the general plan and action 6.25A of the general plan. The proposed mechanical equipment would be, as I mentioned earlier, underground and will be adequately set back from living areas of residential structures. As conditioned, the project will comply with the city's noise ordinance and will not generate excessive noise. Um, the, the project is categorically exempt under CEQA um, pursuant to section 15302, which is a class two exemption because this project involves a replacement of existing structures on the same site as the structure replaced and will have substantially the same purpose and capacity as a structure replaced. With this, staff has, can make um, positive findings and recommends that the Planning Commission adopt resolutions approving administrative use permit numbers 19-25, 19-26, 19-27, 19-28, 19-29, 19 and 19-29. Um, this concludes the staff report. The applicant is here to, um, to answer any planning commission questions and to also supplement um, what I have already discussed. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Does the commission have any questions of staff before we bring the applicant up? I did nope. want to let the uh, city attorney uh, provide a little bit of information yeah, absolutely. on the Please do. Wireless Telecommunication Act. So, uh, as, as I'm sure you are, you are all aware, at this, um, this is as much for the public as it is for the Planning Commission, federal law prohibits uh, the city and therefore the Planning Commission from taking into account whether uh, the proposed facilities uh, will create negative health consequences based on radio frequency emissions. So if that is a concern of members of the public, legally the city cannot take those into consideration and will not take those into consideration. What the City Council does have the authority to do and can do, and as a matter of fact, staff is recommending that they do, is adopt conditions that say essentially that they must comply with federal radio frequency emission requirements. You can see uh, conditions F and G both relate to that to ensure that, the com that these facilities in fact do comply with federal standards and requirements um, and that actually as installed, it actually in fact does comply with these requirements. So. Um, I, I know that often members of the public wish to communicate on those items, but if you do communicate on that, then the city can then the planning commission will have to inform you that they will not be taking that information into account. The city council certain, sorry, the planning commission certainly can consider um, that what's, what is before you is whether you can make the five findings. And the, among those findings essentially are related to aesthetics. Is this going to create something that will be uh, not desirable in the community because of the particular design or because of the particular location. It would maybe that location would be better somewhere else or maybe it's a good location. So essentially uh, aesthetics is, should be the main criteria by which you're judging these facilities. Thank you. Now any questions of staff? Yeah, Commissioner Holtz. Uh, are the existing uh, poles that are there now, are they wood and are going to be replaced to metal? No. They're all metal now? Um, concrete. 
concrete? Yes. Okay. These are the photo, um, let me see. These are the photographs of the existing ones. Okay. So they're going to remove the concrete and, and replace it with the metal? No, they're going to replace it with concrete. More, it's, yeah, marbleite concrete. Okay. So. Thank you. Question? Go ahead. The size of the existing pole, what, how many inches diameter versus the new replacement pole that they're going to do? Um, the existing pole is 20, uh, is, let's see, um, I'm not sure what the diameter of the existing pole and see if they have it on the plan. Actually, this is not for, uh, for the discussions, but I like, I, I was having difficulty reading the plan too. The, the wording and the letter is so small, I could barely read it. So in the future, can you at least have it 24 by 36 on, on a plan that we can at least read the number? Yes, those. Okay, sure, we'll do. So right now, currently, we don't know what the existing size of the pole versus the new um, proposed pole. Um, I don't have that information right now, but I can go ahead and spend some time during the meeting and look it up. And the applicant could probably further provide information on that since they're the expert on this, but on C1, it looks like it might be about a, about 12 inches in diameter. I see 11.8. Wouldn't it be the Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be the same diameter? You're just replacing the pole. It's just going to be a foot shorter. It would be the same diameter. Uh, again, that may be. That's a question for the applicant. I think. To, I don't. We, we, I think. This I mean. Is the I mean. Point. They don't make. They, they don't make. The, uh, you, first of all, they're they're marbleized, and I don't think they make it an inch or two bigger. They are, are they come in a set a standard uh, size? Agreed. Okay. Well, there's going to be a lot of wires inside that. A lot more wire. Why don't we hear from the applicant? Any, any other questions of staff? No. Okay. The applicant, Cynthia, are you here? Yes. Okay. Please come on down and talk to us for a little while. Uh, hello. My name is Cynthia Denise. Um, I'm accompanied by Bob Jystad, and we are here to on the show of Crown Castle. Crown Castle is the largest wireless infrastructure. We have approximately 21,000 nodes, which is supported by 65,000 miles of fiber. The locations that we selected was based on RF analysis to service the consumer in these areas, which will result, result in higher internet speeds, connectivity, and also just better overall cell phone coverage. So we are here just to answer any questions that you have regarding the five application. Okay. All right. Is that your is that your presentation or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any questions of the applicant? I have one actually. The total of five in that particular area. Um, you said that it's needed because of the coverage. Um, what's lacking in that area versus it's present right now? Because we don't have any data. Is there? During the application submittals, I did submit the um, RF coverage maps. Um, I, don't, I didn't bring a copy with that, but with those coverage maps, it states that, that we need more capacity in those areas to service the consumers in that areas. There are, one of them is right next to each other. So does that cover the capacity as well? You're speaking about, and looking and doing the distances, they are, over 250 feet separated from each other. So which specifically? 26 and 28 on Temple Avenue. Down in the bottom. Yeah, 26 and 28. Okay, so when I measured the distances between the two, the coverage is over, there. It's, it, the separation is over 250 feet. And also, um, in looking at the proposed installation, of the facilities, they are pointing away from the residences. So they're, the direction that they're pointing is the coverage area that we're trying to service. 
So how many can each of these cells service? I'm sorry. How many, how many, how many customers or? Um, it's more of an area. It's more of, it's 500 feet. It's a 500 feet radius from the direction that the antenna is pointing. Five hundred feet in the direction that the antenna is pointing. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions, Commissioner Hawkins? Yes, <clears throat> I have a question about um, the um, exterior of the shrouds, and um, we heard in the report that uh, the color of the shrouds will be uh, similar in color to the poles themselves. Um, but what kind of surface? Uh, is on the uh, exterior of the shrouds. Is it a uh, is it a, a painted coating? Is it um, the the finish of of the metal that gives it that color? What kind of what what gives uh, creates the color on the exterior of the surface? And can is it a surface that could be easily altered? You know, uh, or is that even possible to do if you want, if the color you want needed to be adjusted, so to speak. So all of the installations that we do, we do paint all of the equipment to match the color of the pole, a non-reflective color, like an opaque color to match the color of the pole. So to answer your question, we would paint it to whatever the color of the pole is to match it. Okay, so the what, what, what uh, provides for whatever color is on the exterior of the shroud is, is a, a painted coating. Correct. Uh, okay, so when when you replace the SCE poles, then they're now your poles, correct? They're no longer Edison poles. Um, they they are still managed by SCE. Okay. So okay. we're just replacing the poles. Just replacing. Okay. And I have another question. Um, part of the staff report says that these SWFs are designed to improve the wire service for T-Mobile by supplementing the macro cell site that's at the Seafood Shopping Center at Amar Azusa. So are these SWFs, are they basically, I guess, are they parasitic to, a, to the macro cell or do they operate, do they need to, does there need to be a, 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 a regular cell site in the area? It's all dependent upon the area. For this particular situation, the macro cell you're speaking about is most likely a, mo a monopole tower. And so the reason that we're going into the res residential areas is to service literally just the residences in these areas because the capacity has been limited. So that's why it's imperative that we go into the residential areas to service them. So to answer your question, they don't work off of each other. The, the small sites are independent. They don't need Correct. to be near a, uh, a, big, a big cell site, right? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Hawkins. <laughs> I'm still thinking about my, my question that I had for you earlier and wanted to expand on that. Um, so with the coated painting uh, that's, uh, um, the paint coating that's on the outside of the shroud, uh, if, if there is an interest in changing the color on that, um, would there would there be a specification on how that could be done, and a, and a, and what procedure might we consider if we want to ch see the color of that that's on the exterior of the shroud changed? You would want it to no longer match the color of the pole. N not. So, it, I'm just thinking hypothetically if yeah. there was you know, if some adjust in, uh, uh, adjustment of the color or a change in the color, just hypothetically, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know what you know, procedure or recourse do we have to change the color? Um, you just can notify us and let us know exactly what you're looking to do and we would move forward and change it out. But normally we, uh, the normal course of business is to have it be aesthetically pleasing to the eye to make it all one color. Assuming that Correct. that's what yeah. we or, the, or residents in the area think that that's what's aesthetically pleasing. Correct. Okay. Understood. Commissioner Hang? Um, perhaps you have the answer that I was asking staff earlier regarding the size of the existing pole, mm -hmm. the diameter, and the new diameter to this particular one. And then on top of this light pole, apparently it seems like 
again, I can't really read the diagram because it's so small. Mm -hmm. It appears to be two feet wide mm -hmm. by 66 inches, which is about five and a half feet tall. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you'll probably about, I would say give or take plus or minus five feet. So this thing on top of the telephone pole, which is, what do you call that, the, the antenna? The radar. The radium mm -hmm. is five feet six, so most likely it'll be taller than you and wider than you mm -hmm. on top of this particular telephone uh, the light street light. Mm -hmm. The street light. So how big is this street light? So the street light, the existing is 11.8 inches, and we are going up to, we're going up to, I believe, a little bit over 12. So it's only increasing by a little bit, and it's to accommodate the cables for the extra equipment that's going up top. The radome is 5.6 inches tall, and it's about 14.8 inches in diameter. But I, I believe on the diagram, can someone verify for me then, staff? I thought it was 24 inches. The, the radome on, on the elevations, is, it does say that it's 24 inches, but we conditioned it to match the details, which is, which is. Um, yeah, so to be clear on that, C, C, C1 shows that it's 24 inches, but C3 shows that it's 14.6. So there's a little bit of inconsistency in the plans, and I, our assumption is they can do the 14.6 because it's on the plans. So page, the pages are numbered. If you look at the bottom right corner, you'll see C1, and then you'll see C2 on the next page. And it's the first page, let me sort of start on the first page. The first page says T1, second page says GN1, then the next page is C1, and that's where you can see the, the size of the antenna off to the, to the left. Uh, there's the pole, and the ray dome there shows 24 inch diameter. I'm sure they are. They're the same plants we're looking at. So, um, hi, I, I, I'm Bob Jystedham, um, uh, uh, Government Relations Manager for Crown Castle. And my territory generally is Inland Empire and some LA. Um, so, these are Edison streetlights. And Edison has a template that they use because they obviously deal with every single carrier and other companies like us who install these. And so they have they have two different sizes of street lights and they have one size of, well they have two different sizes of radomes. They have a very small radome. And then they have a 50, they have the <coughs> 66 inch by 24 inch radome. So what happens is when we get our designs approved, they give us that template and we include that uh, in the drawings. But our actual radome is 14.6 inches to accommodate the T-Mobile radios by um, 66 inches. So that's why there's a little bit of a difference. That's, that's my only reason is to try to help you understand that. The, the, um, she's right, the new pole is roughly 12 inches. I think the old pole is close to that. It may be one or two inches in less in diameter, but it's really only to accommodate the additional cabling on the inside. Any other questions? Of staff. No, and everything, all the equipment's underground, right? So they're gonna have to dig, dig that up and, and install the equipment. Um, underground or? The equipment. The antennas and the RRUs will go up top. Everything's on top, so nothing is underground. So every all the support is at the top. Yes. Okay. No, very good. Okay. Any other questions? I actually have one. So if all the equipment's on top, so what are those little boxes next to the pictures to the <coughs> right? Next one. You're speaking about the this one right here? Oh, Dis it says the disconnect and the fiber box. Yeah, yeah the, fi the fiber and the um, 
meters underground WCR. So how big are these boxes underground? There are three of them? You need three? One, two, three? Yes, and I'm, I'm not for certain of the actual size of the underground boxes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I think we're done for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, uh, a public hearing. I have one card. Mr. Ogden, I don't know whether you're for or against, so you just want to... Anybody else in favor? No? I like the way you make a decision, Mr. Ogden. You are... All right, come on up. George Ogden. This is going to be uh, probably somewhat mute now because of the direction this commission took. I thought it would be a public comments prior to the discussion of this. Actually, I, I, I came here with the consensus that I would be able to talk first in regards to getting some of this information out here. But my concern is, is that um, we do have a commissioner that's on the panel that I think we need to consider. And she's done a good job and she's actually asked some good questions tonight, but because of her previous you might say commitments and negativity towards mobile systems and stuff like this, and it's out there. And I, I'm concerned with the fact that if, if she continues on with this topic, that she could be compromised, okay, because of the negativity, the prejudice that you have and the bias that you have with this equipment, okay? And the reason I'm bringing this up, and with just if I may, a show of hands, who remembers Carlos Thrasher? Herb, do you remember him? Guy behind me, do you know who he is? No, okay. Let me just run by you real quick here. Carlos Thrasher was on the Planning Commission. There was an issue that came before the Planning Commission and he actually did not recuse himself. This ended up, even though the issue that came before the Planning Commission was a 5-0 vote not to do something, but he was involved with that one vote. Steve Cooley was the district attorney at that time, and along with the FPPC, and the complainant was Ziad al-Hassan, because it was one of his projects, filed suit against Carlos Thrasher. Carlos Thrasher was a three-time war hero, in my opinion, He's with the Marines. He served three tours overseas, and, and it was a shame what happened to him. He got arrested. He was handcuffed. It ruined his career. And after many years of him having to go through this, you know, for taking the appointment in 2005, and for him to get nailed with this, only to be thrown out of court, ruined his career in the military and here, and I don't want to see that happen to anybody on this commission. So this applies to anybody is what I'm talking about. If you feel that you're compromised, okay, it might be an idea to recuse yourself or simply not vote on the project. And, you know, you get on some people's Facebook pages and you see a picture like this is difficult to feel that you're not biased if you guys have put this on here, okay? And... I want to make sure that our commissioners are safe, all right? I was a commissioner here for over 10 years, and I retired. And the, we go through training sessions, I'm sure you all have. And the attorneys at the time that, would go through, that took us through these training missions simply said, if you feel or you are in doubt, okay, that you might be compromised with joining a discussion whether it be on this dais or outside of the dais, remove yourself from that discussion, okay? And I believe that this could apply here. Now, I have taken a lot of the elements out of here that I did want to talk about, and I did that for a reason. 
but I'm sure the attorney, if, he, if somebody felt that they needed to ask for an opinion, I'm sure you'd be able to help out. But just keep yourself safe, each and every one of you, okay, when it comes to this, because I don't want to see something happen in case the applicant feels that there was prejudice prior to the vote, okay? So I want to thank you for at least listening to me on this and, and you know, take care of yourself, okay? Thank you, Mr. Ogden. Anybody else wish to speak? I know, I know, I'm just, I know. <laughs> um, he's, we're gonna do that, yes. So uh, the, the suggestion was made that, uh, as I heard it, that Commissioner Hang might be biased is what I heard the implication. So I guess the question that I would have for Commissioner Hang is, um, are you, um, well, you said she, so there's only one. I was able to figure that out. Um, my law school education helped me uh, <laughs> substantially in that regard. So uh, the question that I have for you um, is that essentially is are you biased insofar as um, are you willing to approve or deny an application in each of these applications based on the record before you? Actually, I'd like to speak for myself. Um, thank you for all the um, advice or word that you had, you know, publicly, um, you know, stating to me. But I like to say that, you know, in terms of this particular position is as a planning commission, it is in a position that's being appointed by city council. And we are here not to just take my personal issues. I need to set aside to serve the entire community, not just for my area, all the entire West Carolina and West Carolina residents. Whether it's, um, yes, I may be most knowledgeable in this area and I ask questions just basically so that I can make my decisions properly. There are things on the plan that I cannot even read. If you're looking at plan that traditionally that comes in a 24 by 14, it comes in this size. And the wording is so small, that's why I'm asking for all these informations. If I can read it, perhaps maybe I don't have to ask that many questions. Now, it's important, it is true that by law, we cannot basically make our decisions, which I will not make our decision based on RF issues. However, there are also a lot of, um, in terms of approving a project, there's a lot of issues that we have to look at. Locations, whether it fit for our cities, all the residents in West Covina. Location is just one of the items. How, what's the size of these things? Will it fit in our community? What does it look like? I mean, most residents may not know what the dimensions are. I myself don't even know what it looked like on top of a pole. It's not like I can go somewhere that I can drive to and look at this thing and say, oh yeah, I've seen it. This looks great for our neighborhood. I haven't seen that yet, and I've been looking around. So aesthetic is also another concern for our residents. Not only affect me as, an, uh, as one resident that's driving around, but it really impacts the people who live in that area. And all of a sudden, there are five of these that I have to take into consideration. Now, as a planning commissioner, like I said, it's not just based on bias or not bias. I also have, to, with every project, we also need to consider all the residents, whether it's gonna be good for today, tomorrow, or beyond. If we're passing five today, how many are we gonna pass in the future? So every decision that I make, I have to take all that into consideration. Not only also for my future as well. I may not sit here after a few years. But every decision that I make today will also affect my livelihood in the future as well. So again, I wanted to say that this decision is not easy. That's why I'm asking all the questions so that I can have all the information to make a wide decisions that will affect the entire resident and no, I will not be biased based on this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any further comment, Mr. City Attorney? That's fine, it's, yeah, it's, uh, what, what we heard was essentially she'll willing to approve, willing to deny based on aesthetics. Okay, very good. Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Nope, so there's no reason for rebuttal. 
So we will close the public testimony portion of the hearing and any further comment from staff? Well, I, uh, I did notice on, on sheet C2, there is the box size for the ones in the ground and it's about 22 inches by 35. So it's about two feet by three feet. Each box will be about two feet by three feet. It's on the left side of C2. That's all the comment I had. All right, very good. Then we will uh, move to, uh, com oh, Commissioner Holtz. Might sound like a dumb question, but I just thought of it. Are all these poles gonna be on city property? Or are they gonna be on people's property? No, they're all, and this is a, this is a, this is what we've been talking about. So these are things on the city public right of way. Okay, because some of the pictures look like it are people's front yards. No, they're all on city okay. property. Thank you. If it was on private property, we wouldn't be going through this process. We'd be going through the, the standard process that you know and love. Thank you. Any other comment on uh, here? Commissioner Hang? Good for now? Okay. So, discussion. Who wants to uh, take the lead on this? Anybody in the audience take the lead on this? No. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Hakez, do you want to start with yeah. you? I'm just going to add one final comment about, you know, the exterior appearance of the shroud. And, you know, um, and uh, I got a little insight from Commissioner Kenny about how the color selection is how the color works to match the pole. Um, but we never know uh, with this being an altogether new thing coming into our neighborhoods, um, what that impact is gonna have on, on, on people with people's reactions to it. Um, we never know if someone might say, well, why does it have to be that color? Um, who knows? Um, and that's why I asked the question of you know, is there, is there a way to change the color? Is there a, a way to, you know, work with, um, in this case, you know, Crown Castle to, to change the color if there was, if it was seen as an opportunity to make it look different than the way it's now proposed. Um, so I just wanted to uh, put that out there as to reason why I was, you know, bringing up that, that matter. Commissioner Kennedy, did you, did you want to maybe well, share? I, 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 will elaborate on, I will elaborate on that. Uh, um, so um, how Edison works is uh, those poles are, are marbleized, so uh, they're multi-spec they're multi uh, is, is what they are. And when they get hit, they, they use this color t called stone, and, and that's their general match. Um, and that's just on those poles. Now when you get to the, the, the metal poles, they're, they're a different story. Um, however, I, I, I would agree, hey, if the residents don't like the color, uh, I think uh, we should be able to change it. Um, I'm all for that. As long as we have the flexibility. Yeah, I, absolutely. Okay. Commissioner Holtz. Commissioner Hang. I actually, um, since I saw the design, um, I've been driving around and looking and hoping to see something on top of a light pole, what it looks like and what the size are. Um, I'm having difficulty finding that in West Covina. Um, and especially clo so close proximity to the house. Some of them, it's only a few feet away. Um, I like to see, I'm more comfortable if they can put a prop up there and see how big the radon will look like for the resident, since it's right up front in their, in their face, basically. And there are a total of five of them in that neighborhood. If you can set something up like that and see what it looked like, I'm not comfortable because aesthetically, I just, one, I don't understand how large it is. And this is not only that we're approving one thing, we're also setting a precedent as well, because if, you, if we just recently basically approved that there's no small cell in a residential area, and it's stated in here. It said the proposed small cell do not comply with the 100 feet required minimum distance from residential properties. Now, as I was looking at it, I was looking, when I was looking at the light pole, I was also trying to imagine what does it look like on top of this thing. So I got a little prop for every one of us to take a look at. but I picked this up from somewhere, and this one right here is 
going to sit on top of the telephone pole, which is, it said, based on, I'm looking for something for two feet by 66 inches, and I am about a little bit over five feet. So it's a lot taller than me, probably a third more, and this is uh, less than 24. So this right here will sit on top of the telephone, I mean a uh, light pole. Sorry, it's limited. So this is not the exact size, but it will be a little bit taller and possibly a little bit wider. So this is what it's going to look like. So I'm having difficulty imagining what this will look like, and the public and everyone needs to see. So this is how big it is. It's going to be taller than me and how wide it is, and it's all in circular. So we're having difficulty seeing what that actually looks like in front, in front of people's home and also the corners, because a lot of this is also placed at the corner of intersection as well. So this put into perspective, and I just can't imagine, even right now, it just right, I'm holding the board up, but I can see it. But on top of a pole, how does it look to me? I don't know, and I don't know how, how that will look in the public's eye as well, because we don't, we don't really know what it looks like. So that, that is a concerning, because one, we're not only approving one, but we're approving five of these, and I like to see more, and the data, it seems like Aesthetically, to me, it's not pleasing to have these gigantic things on top of a telephone, um, on top of a light pole that currently the light pole do not have these radon on top of. Um, on top of that, some of the home over there do have second stories, and how does that look out the windows? So that's concerning as well. And also, as I was driving around the street, how does that look in perspective? How big is it? I don't really know how close will that look, because I can see how big the board is in front of me, but I'm not sure how that sits on a 20-foot or 28 light pole will look like, whether it looks big, whether it looks small. So location-wide, it's an issue. Aesthetic-wise, to me, it's concerning, especially around the area, and the fact that our code does not allow this to be in residential areas, so that, that to me, is a little bit concerning as well. So that's. Well, to, just to be, to clarify a little bit, I, I'm not sure what your dimension is there, but, but this is 11, this is 11 inches wide. So the, the radius is 14 inches. So this is, this is the width. It's more about this wide. That's probably about 24 inches wide. So it's much more, that is much wider than the ray dome would be. Well, like I said, I could barely read the plant, and when I came today, I was looking for something similar. I don't have anyone to cut it to size. Fair so enough. I just well, pick something and, and that looks somewhat. And I'm just somewhat. trying to clarify so that right. we know what the number is. So as long as our commissioner also understand that 66 inches is how tall it is, I, I mean, I can imagine that because I'm a little bit over five feet, so it has to be taller than me. So that board is not taller than me. So this thing is sitting on top of the light pole, which... Currently, I don't see anything like that sitting on top of the light pole. So how, how big or how small it is, I don't know. So that, that especially, it's only a few feet in front of someone's front yard out the windows. So that can be also aesthetically, it's not, it wouldn't be pleasing. I, I wouldn't know. Yes, Commissioner Holtz, please. Uh, is there a, a location uh, fairly close by where some of these are installed where we can see them? A number of these have been installed on uh, on Edison poles. Um, uh, uh, most of them are actually sort of in the city of LA area. So if you're in the downtown area, you'll see a number as you drive around there. Um, we've installed a total of well, we've we're under contract to install about 1,100. We've installed about 450 nodes all around um, Orange County and Los Angeles County right now. So um, there's a number out there. There also, by the way, were a number of nodes installed on top of um, streetlights in the past decade that were part of an older technology. But, um, but if you look around, you'll, you'll, you'll see a number of these. I mean, the thing that's interesting, it's just my own perspective, but the thing that's interesting is that you'd be surprised when you put something on top of a 
23 or 24 foot pole, how it, it, it doesn't look the same as it does when you have it on the floor standing next to you. But that's just, you know, that's my own perspective. So, so the answer is there's no, no close by installation. Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't point you to okay. one. Thank you. But, yeah. I have a question. Sir, is this what it's supposed to look like? See, but it's yeah. roughly speaking. That's okay. Right. That's so right. it's 14 inches in diameter, correct? 14 and a half inches. Thank, Thank you. Right. Any other questions for the gentleman while he's up here, or no? No. Okay. To clarify, um, the proposed the project plans or the proposal um, includes that indicates that it's 14. I'm sorry, it indicates that it's 24 inches in diameter, but it's going to, it's actually going to be 14, um, about or approximately 14 inches in diameter. So it's going to, it's not going to be as, um, it's not, it's not going to look exactly like this because, um, in the elevations, uh, um, this particular one is 12, 24 inches in diameter. Okay. Uh, I have a, just a couple of comments to make. We have in the past approved cell phone towers in flagpoles. There are some in parks in the city and they look like flagpoles on steroids. You know, they're very muscular. You know, the whole pole is what I would call muscular all the way to the top and it gets even bigger at the top. You know, so you can kind of see what that is. And we've done that. There's a couple of those out there, you know. So we also sent the legal notice to 447 owners and occupants of properties located within 300 feet of the site. And I think we had how many? Two, three? Two. I two? received um, two phone calls and one email. Okay, so these are the people that are most directly impacted by this. And as you can see by the response we got electronically and by the number of people in the empty seats, you know, apparently there's not a lot of concern. Now there may be, who knows, this is the first time we're doing this here. We haven't had this before. When, you know, they, again, you know, a lot of neighbors, a lot of residents, they go, you know, when did this happen? What is this? then we might hear about it later. I don't know. But I can tell you that this technology is here to stay. And it's, it's growing. You know, now we're talking about 5G, which, you know, our phones are going to be 5G, and, you know, God knows how high they'll go after that. And a few years ago, there was... Concern. There still is concern about the number of traditional cell tower sites that popped up in parks and in parking lots and in commercial areas and, and so forth. And, you know, we, we, we disguised them, you know, by trees or, you know, water towers or whatever. So, you know, this to me is a way to provide the coverage by basically, you know, putting this shroud on top of a light pole and you know sometimes you just have to take a look and see what works so you know that's kind of my two cents on it commissioner Haquez. well i'll add my own two cents too in that um it's a you know we're we're in a position where we're kind of in between a rock and a hard place in that, you know, the advent of the new technologies are, um, are, are coming in a, in a, in a way that, you know, is, you know, we have to find a way to incorporate into our lives. Um, but there is a, this other aspect of, um, what, you know, in, intrudes into our real space and how do we deal with that? And, um, and I think, there, there's one point that Commissioner Hang, uh, you know, brings up. Even though we got some clarification on the on the on the dimensions of the of the shroud being, it's not 24 inches wide; it's 14 and a half inches wide. Um, that 
there's still a lack of clarity in my mind as to how it will actually look in, in reality. Um, the presentation of the, the plans and the, and the, and the mocked up images, um, to me just don't really give a very good idea of what they will look like in reality. And, and mainly because, um, you know, when I, I probably saw me unfolding all these different uh, examples and then looking at them side by side and no one looks the same uh, compared to the other. And, um, and that's probably because it's, you know, a, it's meant, not meant to. It actually says right there, scale, NTS, not to scale. And so it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be a, a, a fair representation of it, how it will actually look. It's not, it's a not to scale image. So, um, so, you know, so I do have a little concern about how it will actually look in reality. Um, and, um, I, I, and while I can imagine, and I'm only imagining that uh, the shroud on top of a, a 20 foot pole will not look as, you know, intrusive 20 foot, 28 foot feet high, uh, being 14 and a half inches wide and 60 and six inches, 66 inches high. Um, it's, um, there's nothing like getting a real life view of what that looks like. And, um, so I just wanted to point out that if you're going to use this as a, as a, as a measure of what you what it think it might look like, none, none of these accurately represent what it might look like. They're not intended to because it's clearly stated there. It's not to scale. I would, it'd be great if we could see an example. And unfortunately there's nothing close by, but um, it would give us, at least give us an idea of, of uh, what we're dealing with and, and how we might uh, address some of the concerns people might have. But um, if there's any way we can do that, is there any way that maybe, you know, uh, Crown, um, Crown Castle can mock up something <laughs> on a pole, on an existing pole? Uh, it doesn't take much to mock something up and, you know, taking a, maybe a, you know, a cardboard tube and putting it on top of a pole. What does that look like on top of a pole even, you know, less than 28 feet high? Um, maybe it's not, maybe it's not so bad, but, how can we tell, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't tell us how. Commissioner Holtz. Yeah, I think there's a big difference uh, uh, whether you're gonna put it in a commercial area or, or a residential. I, you probably wouldn't even notice if it was in a commercial area because of all the other equipment that's out there. Uh, but I was just thinking, it, it, this is T-Mobile. What happens when the other companies come forward and they want to do the same thing? They're not going to share that pole, correct? So, so now I'm AT and T. I want to do the same thing, uh, or I'm Spectrum, or what are the other ones? Are they going to put up poles too? Uh, the answer is sometimes yes, and sometimes no. They might co-locate. They might have to put up new new poles. Co-locate with the existing ones. So sometimes the. Sometimes they're designed. Um, this is a large radome, so my yeah. guess is that there is ability to co-locate. I'm getting I'm getting nods saying that there is ability to co-locate. Okay. Uh, sometimes they desire to do so, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Well, and, well, and it's, it's part of this is a dis is a discussion. We it's kind of it's part of our study session tonight on this code amendment. Yeah. But understand that. Uh, the issues that they're having, they expressed it tonight, the issues they're having for service to their customers is in residential areas. Right. They're not having problem with commercial because there's plenty of coverage in commercial right. areas. So, but, you're, but yes, you, you're, you're right, that this is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, well, yeah, 5G and 6G and all that, they're all gonna expand. And I'm sure uh, with the, uh, when they expand, they're gonna have even probably smaller boxes and everything, but. Uh, it is a concern of mine how many poles we're going to have hanging around the city. You know, I don't see how we can turn one down after we approve another one. But uh, I, I like the design and all this. I don't have a problem with it at all. Uh, and I wouldn't mind one of those in front of my house. But uh, how many more are coming in the future? That's, that's my concern. Well, they're replacing existing poles, right? They're not adding poles. To they're replacing existing light poles. That's yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's one for one. 
Yeah. And but I'm but putting I'm three or four in a row. When other companies for come in. For, for any service provider. Yeah. I mean, Edison, Edison isn't looking, well, I can't speak for Edison. I, I don't think any of us can. But Edison's not looking to increase the number of light poles because no. there's a cost for them. They're looking to keep the same number. So the whole, yeah. the whole idea here is to replace like for like. And the applicant could probably answer that question from more of a technical point or practical point of view because that's what they're in the business to do. But that's our understanding. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a lot more light poles around that they can use. Yeah, other there's 6,000 or something in right. the city, yes. Okay, I just wanted this thought. One of the issues that we have, um, I think, that has been a, a <laughs> being in this as a planner from the beginning, if I had to go back and do something on our wireless, it would have been to do what these guys are doing now. One of the problems with the, w what we don't like about a lot of the, the wireless facilities is you can see the antenna, and the antenna keep growing. So it's like, it's like it's got a cancer, and it just keeps growing, and what used to almost look like a tree no longer has any forbearance of looking like a tree. But that's one of the things that is sort of solved in this situation. You can't see the antenna. The shroud you can see, but you can't see the antenna. So that, that I think is a very good thing, and we should think that way. I think as we move forward with other wireless facilities, we should be thinking, conceal the antennas, put them behind something, put them in a shroud, put them behind something that you can't see when they grow from, from four, four, inches, four feet tall to eight, in, eight feet tall and, and a foot deep that you, you can't, you can't tell that. So at any rate, that, that's just a little bit of my confession of a planner who's been through this from the first one that ever came in and when I worked at Monterey Park. So, Well, you know, you make a valid point. It seems to me if they were to show up here with, with this type of a proposal and at the very top was just a cluster of wiring, we would say, gee, can't you cover that up with something? Can't you cut, we'll put a shroud over it or something so we can't see all those wires? Well, that's what's in front of us, just like that. So, you know, I mean, it's whatever turns your crank, you know. Well, I think there's been some discussion here, and I, at some point, I think maybe if you, if you come to a, a consensus, you can ask the applicant what they might be, might or might not be willing to do to um, provide you some information to, to help make that, uh, under, I shouldn't say, to help you understand what it will look like. And keeping in mind, again, that the, the the question before you is not, is it a good idea? The question is, how does it look, and is it acceptable? Is it a good design? I would think with all the computer technology, they could do something on a computer that would show us basically what it looked like without actually going out and putting a pole on. It's a scale. Yeah. As opposed to the map. Well, what is the pleasure of the commission? I mean, you know, I, you want them to... to continue this if they were willing to bring something like that back or is there a motion to go forward now I'll make a motion to go forward I actually like to see if possible that they can do a prop in the five location that they like to do so all the residents can see what it will look like all they have to do is put a a pole up with a tube that Commissioner Hulk has had recommended on top so we can see what it looked like. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not impossible. I've seen people do prop all the time in that sense, in a true sense that we can see what it looked like. And all the neighborhood can see what it looked like too, since there, we have five of them. Might as well just put them all out there so for everyone to see. I like to see that happening. Uh, Commissioner Kennedy, was that a motion that you were making? That was a motion. Okay, so what's the motion? So the motion is to approve yeah. the recommendation? Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? No? Okay. Let's have a roll call on the motion. I guess the discussion is good. Um, well, can I make an amendment to, uh, to the motion? Absolutely. Okay. Um, my amendment to the motion would be that to move forward, uh, and if it was uh, possible to provide some sort of field demonstration, if uh, Crown Castle can provide a field demonstration like um, Commissioner Hang was suggesting, or I, and I originally kind of threw out there as an idea, but to if Crown Castle could do a, a, some sort of mocked up field demonstration, what it might look like, and, um, uh, and or uh, 
some some sort of two scale, you know, um, um, graphical representation of what it would look like. You know, certainly the technology with you know, you know, BIM drawings that could be done to show us rather than this type of not to scale drawing. Um, so that we have something to demonstrate to that community what it might look like. And uh, so that would be my, that would be my amendment to see if uh, Crown Cost would be willing to do a, a mock-up. Is that an amendment? That doesn't sound, doesn't sound like an well, amendment. Yeah, that, that's a motion. So, th so that's a request to amend the motion, but uh, it sounds like they're inconsistent because one is approval and one is to request that they uh, do a mock -up. Maybe there is an inconsistency there because it doesn't move it forward. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, you, sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for because yeah. you, you might ask for something like that and it might just cause a big turmoil amongst the people. So no, I'm, I'm not in favor of doing a, a mock up like that. Well, we do have a motion and a second on the floor. So. So um, I guess the substitute motion is withdrawn. We'll consider the withdrawn. original motion. Okay. Withdrawn. Okay. So let's go ahead and have a roll call on Commissioner Kennedy's motion and my second. Okay. So the motion is, and I haven't read any numbers yet. We'll do that depending on what happens here. But the motion is to approve as presented. Uh, Commissioner Holtz. Aye. Commissioner Hing. No. Commissioner Kennedy. Aye. Commissioner Haquez. No. Uh, Chairman Redholz. Aye. So that's a three to two. So it's three favor. to two. Let, let me um, uh, let, let me go back for a second, though. There was some discussion about the painting of the shroud and maybe the possibility of allowing staff to work with. Uh, what, uh, what I understood Commissioner Huck has to be asking the applicant was, if it gets constructed and people don't like the color, can we go back and, and talk to them about a different color? Am I understanding correctly? So if the applicant is comfortable with that, we'd like we'll, we'll amend. Condition P, I think, in the, in or I'm sorry, D, in the resolutions, which talks about the color, will amend that to say and modify color if, uh, d if dis uh, with discussion between the applicant and and staff. So we'll we'll do that. Uh, if everyone is, I'll ask the maker of the motion in the second if they're comfortable with that mm -hmm. amendment. Absolutely. Yes. Let okay. me let me ask a question before we do that. If you can allow them to, to change colors on that, what's going to look like Bozo the Clown of a circus out there? One wants a red, one wants a green. One. <laughs> I think if you if you make it the same color as the pole, it'll blend in a lot better than if all of a sudden you got a pole that's this marble color and all of a sudden you've got red up there. And then no. how do you how do you get somebody that says I don't want red? So uh, this is between staff. We're not going to let we're not going to let it be a free for all. But w w they're going to paint it the color they're specifying. So right. the issue is if sometimes paint color, well, I think we've all been through this, you paint and you go, well, that's not the color I thought it was going to be. That's what Commissioner Haquez is saying. If the color doesn't turn out to be pleasant or pl pleasing to the eye or doesn't match the pole, um, then we might want to ask, we'd have the ability to ask them, staff would, to, to paint, but we'd be looking for consistent color. Well, okay, so it's not the public that's going to do it. Right. We're not, okay. we, yeah, we won't ask right. for right. A, a vote on that. And then secondarily, the, the, um, the resolution numbers would be 19-5991, and I won't read them all, but I'll say it goes through 19-5995. Five AUPs, each one will have its own number between one and five in the uh, uh, resolution number. And I think that cleans it up. I don't know that we need to do anything else here. Well, let me motion. just say that there is a 10-day appeal period that... Uh, you know, uh, there's 10 days, 10 calendar days to appeal this decision to the city council. After 10 days, it's a final decision. Okay, I think we're done. Okay, thank you very much. And we will move on to item number three, which is another public hearing. This is a conditional use permit number 19-06 categorical exemption the applicant is ray jiang i hope i'm pronouncing that right for mathnasium learning center and this is at 1414 south azusa avenue units b20 and 21 which is the south hills plaza 
Mr. Anderson, the staff report will be presented by our, um, our planning intern, Balti uh, Barrios. Great, thank you. Good evening, members of the planning commission, members of the public. So the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for the use of a tutoring facility uh, that would be called the Methanasium uh, Learning Center. So the proposed uh, tutoring center would be located in the South Hills Plaza. Um, it's not listed on the PowerPoint, but in the staff report, it is designated as a neighborhood commercial zoning, and this general plan designation is commercial. To the north of the shopping center is a power substation. To the east are single fam is a single family residence and multifamily residences. To the south is our multifamily residences. To the west are multifamily residences and a single family residential. And this project is categor categorically exempt. Um, uh, do uh, uh, categorically exemption class one. Um, and here is an aerial of the site. Here are photos of the existing site and of the frontage of the building as long with the interior of the, uh, of, of the unit in question. And here is a site plan of the, uh, of the entire uh, shopping center. Uh, here is a more close up to the building uh, where the, where the uh, Methanasium last center is being proposed. To be noted, it will be on the second floor of the, uh, of the shopping center. And here is a floor plan of the proposed um, tutoring facility. So the business operations plan is that they plan to operate Monday to Thursday from 2.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Sunday from 2.30 p.m. to 5.30 uh, p.m. No, wait, that's incorrect, actually. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, so from Monday to Thursday, it's gonna be from 2.30 to 7 p.m. and on Sunday, it's gonna be to 5.30 p.m. Uh, max capacity, they plan at any given time to have a max capacity of five staff members and 18 students. And for parking, so an analysis shown that there's a not enough parking for the entire site due to a conditional use permit that allowed the fitness center at a, uh, that allowed it, the fitness center to have a reduced parking rate. Um, so that's some some uh, background information I want to give before I continue. So the required parking for the Mathnasium would be seven parking spaces. Now, if they were designated as a retail shop, they would need to have a total of eight parking spaces. So they meet the required parking space for their unit. And currently staff is not aware of any significant parking issues at the time uh, due to what we believe is that the shopping center is full of different uses that have different peak hours. And currently we are not aware of any parking issues at any given time. To be noted that there are vacancies on the lot, so not every business is occupied, or not every unit is occupied, so there's uh, still um, you know, parking that hasn't been designated to, to every unit. Uh, let's see. Um, based on the findings and uh, based on the conditions of approval, um, staff is recommending that Planning Commission adopt a resolution to approve conditional use permit 19-06. This concludes staff presentation and staff report. The applicant is here. Should the staff, uh, Planning Commissioners have any questions? Thank you. First off, any, any uh, questions of staff? Hearing none, would the applicant like to come forward, please? Hello, my name is Grace Young. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hello, <laughs> my name is Grace Young. Um, I am, um, well, I'm here to request a conditional use permit for a math tutoring center, which is called Mathnasium. Uh, it's a national brand and we have been helping students all over the world. Actually, it's an international brand too. So now I would like to bring the service to West Covina community. Um, is there any questions I can answer? I have a, a, a question. Sure. Um, this is a franchise, correct? Yes. Are you the franchise owner or? Uh, yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to be the owner of the West Covina Center. Uh, and I'm going to be the center director. So basically, I will be the one operating the center. Okay, and there's currently, there's one in Hacienda Heights? I believe Walnut so. Walnut and Covina. There's yes. 
There's three kind of within the same market area. So how do you, how do you go about capturing your, your students? Um, usually parents, they don't send their kids really you know, more than three or four miles away from where they live. So each city pretty much can have one mathnasium. You know, that shouldn't be any problem. Uh, right now, I am the center director even for Pasadena Center. Mm. Um, there are lots of needs. Parents love us. You know, so many kids. Um, so that would not be any problem. Okay. Any other questions? Besides me? No? No other questions. Okay. I think uh, we'll call you if we need you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have no cards. Anyone wish to speak? In favor, this is a public hearing. Anybody wish to speak in favor of the project? Seeing none, any opposed? Seeing none, close the public testimony portion and go for commission discussion. This, this is easier than the last one. So <laughs> Anyone just want to take a stab at it, make a yes, motion okay. or whatever? I have one thing. My, my issue is always the parking. And uh, uh, that's, that's a big thing with me. Um, However, I, I do go to Sing's Donut Shop just about every day. I drink my coffee and eat my donuts, and been doing that for 20 years. Um, so I do sit in there, and, and, and the parking lot is uh, it's full at certain times, but I, I don't think parking in that, in, in that center is going to be an issue whatsoever. Well, again, you know, with a gymnasium, not a mathnasium, but a gymnasium there, uh, depending on when their classes, you know, they have their group classes. It's, it's parking like it's full, but at that end, yeah, you know, it's, it's at the other end. So the end where you're going, it's 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 a little different. I mean, there's you know we've got the post office there, and you know there's there's some parking, but again, if you were to put a regular like a retail store in, it would it would need more parking. So, you know, so again, I don't think it's an issue. So is there a motion on this or any I'll further discussion? Okay. Okay. We need the numbers? Yeah, the reso number here is this conditional use permit, so it's 15 5996. Okay, we have a motion by Kennedy, a second by Hawkez. Roll call, please. Commissioner Holtz? Aye. Commissioner Hing? Aye. Commissioner Kennedy? Aye. Commissioner Hawkez? Aye. Chairman Redholtz? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Once again, there's a 10 day appeal period on this. Thank you very much. Welcome to West Covina, and good luck. Let's pull that down and look for. Okay, yes. One, one recommendation we, uh, I discussed with the chairman is, is relocating yes. item number five to the end. So we'll, I would suggest we do four, six, and seven, and then come to five if, if the uh, planning commission is still awake. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, that's, what, that's what we shall do. Okay, so the next item is item number four, which is a non-hearing item. It's a study session for code amendment number 19-03 temporary non-commercial signs. Mr. Director, report please. Give me a moment to get situated. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah, okay. All right, so this is a code amendment for, uh, it's 1903 for temporary non-commercial signs. On February 6, 2018, the City Council adopted Code Amendment Number 1602, which prohibits temporary non-commercial signs in the public right-of-way. So that they had some other reasons for doing it. There was a um, well, non-commercial signs include banners, real estate signs, and political signs. Any type of sign that's not commercially oriented, so it's not advertising a business. That Code Amendment in the 1602 Code Amendment was in response to a U.S. Supreme Court decision that required all cities to update their, their sign ordinances. So on, on April 2nd, 2019, the City Council initiated this code amendment in response to Mayor Johnson's request to do so. The requested issues to be addressed were adding enforcement standards for those that do not follow the standards, and number two, allowing temporary non-commercial signs in the parkway, the public right-of-way between the private property and the curb of a street. So there are for instance, uh, Sunset or Azusa has a median in the middle, so th that, that would continue to be prohibited if, if, as requested here, but uh, it, when you have an area sort of between the, the curb and, and the front of the property where usually a sidewalk would be, that, 
the idea is here is maybe to allow political signs in, in those circumstances. <clears throat> While the issues raised were specifically related to political signs, <clears throat> any revision to this section would affect all types of temporary non-commercial signs. The primary purpose of this study session is to introduce the Planning Commission to the initiated code amendment and, and to receive any input. So, yep, that's pretty much it. So uh, that, that's really an introduction here. It's not meant to go into a great deal of detail. This is the first time that the, this has been presented to the Planning Commission that this would be coming. So um, that's my presentation. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. And this is a, there is some, obviously if it's a Supreme Court decision, there's some very legal issues we have to deal with in this. And so the, the City Attorney's Office will be part of the preparation of any code amendment we do here. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Commissioner Holtz. Yeah, my, my only concern is with number two, allowing temporary non-commercial. What's temporary? Are we going to put a time limit on it? Uh, otherwise, temporary, I could say, I want to put it up there for a year. If it's a special event or something, I, you know, I don't have a problem with it. But I think we need to put some kind of time parameters in there. So, uh we would draft the code such that a temporary sign would have a definition. Essentially, it would be the, the type of sign. It would be sort of, is it a permanent sign or is it a floppy sign that you could put in the trash in two minutes? That's a temporary sign. How long it's up is a different question than what type of sign it is. So if it's intended to be a permanent sign that's going to last for 20 years, that's not a temporary sign. There are... I didn't go into, I didn't look at the code very closely before this meeting tonight, but there are some definitions in the code now. When we bring it back, those will all be in front of you. And we can, we'll be looking at those as we go forward here. And, and, and I will say uh, what will be presented to you probably will not have uh, too many limitations as far as time because, uh, it, well, we, I don't want to get ahead of myself. There are some ways that we can do it and some ways that we can't. Uh, due to legal constraints, but I, I understand the concern. Well, I would like to leave it up to staff because like, let's say it's an event that's gonna go on July 4th parade. Uh, I can see where they'd have it up a little bit before, but once the, the parade or whatever it is is over, they need to get that sign out of there. And that's something that could be controlled by the staff. I don't think it has to come to, all, to us all the time. We can discuss that and see if we can come up with a way. I mean. Just, just, just for sake of understanding the situation here, some temporary signs, tem temporary non-commercial signs, are not about an event. So that that's the problem. We 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 have to treat them all the same. So w w it's sort of like splitting the atom. But we'll we'll do what we can and, and bring it to you and have discussion. Yeah. So probably what we would end up doing would be that you would have some sort of time limitation. It may not be directly related to the event in particular. It might not because. If you're holding, if, if you have a sign that says Donald Trump, is that relating to an election or is it talking about whether you like him permanently? Um, it's not an event <laughs> or it is an election. It's hard to tell, right? So what event does that relate to? So what you can do instead is you just have a sign that says you can have it up for a specified amount of time and then you don't have to track what event it relates to. Okay, now, you know, my issue or concern that we can deal with this going forward too is the part about adding enforcement standards I mean is that something that falls into our purview is coming up with standards of you know enforcement or levying some you know fine or penalty or I mean where does that where does that land so I, um, as far as the amount of enforcement like that would not be within your purview but certainly what the code says and what the, the scope of how you draft it would certainly lend itself to determining whether you enforce it. How much the, the penalty is is a separate question. Well, you touched my hot button because all these flag banners that are all over the place are illegal and nobody's done anything about it. And, and that code enforcement's uh, uh, job to do that. But I'd like to see some teeth put in that thing because everybody just ignores it and they put up all these what do you call those, feather signs or whatever it is? They're all over the place. Yeah. No, I, I would believe that would be code enforcement once we draft something that says you can or you can't, and if they do, then they need to go out and either cite or give them notice to remove it. Yeah. 
that's a subject for another day. The whole the whole sign criteria actually. There is there's some various discussions going on about those type of things. Yeah. So I, we we hear that, we definitely hear that. Okay. So what else do we need? Nothing. We don't really need anything else from you. Um, if you have questions, if there's no other questions, then any other questions of staff? While we we're don't still even on need it? a vote. We just go to the next item. Okay. Then uh, that was quick and to the point. <laughs> All right. We're going to skip uh, item number five. We'll save that because it's so juicy. And we'll go to, oh boy. All right. Well, let's go to uh, number item number six. Another study session on code amendment number 16-03 relating to small wireless facilities in the public right of way. Looks like planning manager Joanne Burns is up to bat again. Correct. Good evening again, um, planning commissioners, members of the public. Um, with just a bit of background, um, on February 16, 2016, the city council initiated a code amendment to address wireless facilities in the public right of way. On April 14, 2019, there was a um, California Supreme Court decision on T-Mobile West LLC versus city and county of San Francisco, which validated the city's authority to regulate aesthetics. On April 23rd, 2019, the Planning Commission adopted design guidelines for small wireless facilities in the public right of way. On the last study session, which was held on May 14, 2019, um, was regarding small, um, the code amendment for small wireless facilities in the public right of way. During the study session, the Planning Commission reached a consensus to identify design to identify that design, to identify design guidelines in um, in the ordinance by reference, draft the ordinance to require ministerial review for small for small wireless facilities that comply with the design guidelines and, and planning commission review for for all others, and an, and also require new poles to be installed in between properties. The planning commission had questions regarding the maximum distance a pole could be from another pole and a maximum distance a small wireless facility could be from residential properties. Um, let me go over a bit about um, our current design guidelines. So uh, basically our design guideline states that if you follow the guidelines, it'll be approved ministerially. If not, it'll be discretionarily by the planning commission. So basically the the, the shroud and um, antenna has to be streamlined. Uh, it has to, the pole has to be made out of concrete. Um, and the wires would have to be enclosed within the pole and the utility box um, and associated equipment would, be un, would have to be undergrounded. Um, if that's not gonna be the case, then it would be approved by the planning commission. And an example of what, um, the effect of this, this design guideline um, occurred earlier today. Um, these are um, examples of small wireless facilities that are, that are um, some of these were taken outside of the city and I, I believe there was one that was taken in, within the city of West Covina. The, um, the look that we're with the um, design guidelines and the code amendment, the look that we're trying to get to is similar to the, to the um, photograph on the far right, which is this right along here where the arrow is, where the, the pole is concrete. There's a small, there's a sh um, antennas within a shroud on top of the pole that's, that matches similar to the, the size or the, the, the diameter of the existing pole um, with, and that matches the color of the, um, the light pole as well. And all the equipment is undergrounded, so there's nothing sticking out from the sidewalk. Um, I'll go over the 
uh, questions that the Planning Commission had, had asked. Um, one of the questions was regarding separation in between wireless facilities. Uh, what is the, basically, what is the legal distance the city can require to allow one telecommunication um, wireless facility to be from another um, wireless, wireless facility? Um, with this, staff doesn't recommend um, having a hard number um, that basically says it has to be um, X distance away from another telecommunication or a small wireless facility um, because this could potentially allow one telecommunication provider to prevent other market entrants from operating in the area. Um, and it can be looked at as um, if, if uh, since X provider got here first, um, another provider wouldn't be able to locate in, within, within the area. It can be looked at as kind of creating a monopoly, uh, intentionally creating a, a monopoly. Um, and so staff recommends as an alternative, a, the, a minimum distance threshold to trigger a planning commission review. Um, in staff's opinion, a reasonable distance would be between 100 feet to 250 feet. Um, Phil, uh, if the Planning Commission has any input or would like to add on on the matter, um, feel free to, um, to add on um, in regarding this particular issue so that we can have some type of dialogue to go over what's going to go um, be included in the code amendment. Does the Planning Commission have any questions or concerns regarding this topic? Any concerns or questions? Commissioner Ang? Or I, statements? Or Actually, regarding the distance for the um, placement of the tower, it seems like 100 to 200 feet, it's pretty relatively close because some area, the lot frontage is 100 foot, so it can be every house can have one of this thing. So I am, you know, I am basically thinking that it's more distance would be ideal. Um, they can actually um, work with each others to use the facility and share I don't know what the term that they use, but instead of like each home has one of this um, um, facility, I don't think that would be ideal for our city. However, even if it's not, if it's 100 feet, most frontage of the house is 50 feet, so that every other house can potentially have one, that's the minimum. So I'm more looking for, you know, further apart, a few blocks away from each other, at least. So you don't inundate an area with all these um, small cells. In one location. Any other questions? Or you can go ahead, Joanne. Um, it, do you, Do you have a certain number in mind? Um, I was looking at other cities. I believe our city attorney may be familiar with it too. I mean, a thousand foot. What city was it that was using? Uh, distant. I mean, every every few blocks have one of this. I'm more okay with it. So then uh, every other houses have one of this. So. So am I correct in understanding that it wouldn't be a flat prohibition? Rather, it would just be if it's within a thousand feet that it would be planning commission review. Correct. It, it wouldn't be a hard rule to prohibit. Correct. Okay. Then I have less concerns. Uh, the the FCC. Uh, did have a statement saying that there are certain types of technologies where they're concerned that if you have distances that are too great, that that uh, would violate their order. They gave a number of, they said essentially 250 is, I read it as being 250 is clearly okay. Uh, they seem to have issues around 1,000 feet. So it's a judgment call, but if it's planning commission review, then as opposed to denial, then I have less concerns. So let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here. I think that one of the things that we should be trying to do is trying to set design parameters that, that reduce the number that come to planning commission. Because the whole goal, you may think be thinking that the goal to bring into planning commission is to deny them. That's not the goal to bring into planning commission. The goal of all these is to gain some kind of attainment to get approval. So um, the, the concept we should be thinking about is 
what design is okay? And if that design's okay, then is the separation really that big a deal if the design is okay? Um, so, and then if it comes to Planning Commission, uh, Scott can talk about this better than I can, but keep in mind, we haven't talked about it tonight, but there's a, there's a thing called a shot clock. We only have a certain amount of time to review these, which is one of the reasons that these are gonna go fast, and when I say fast, you're gonna notice differences in the normal staff reports we provide in these, because we have to throw them together quickly. We don't have the luxury of going, oh, let's wait two meetings when we have more time. We've gotta put them on the next agenda to make sure we have time to do it. And so, uh, it, it's, a different, it's a different parameter. We, you ha we have to think differently than we do about the conditional use permit we just did, for instance. There was no time clock on that. We could have held that off for another six months and it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done anything illegal on that. We're still working with them. But we have a problem with these because they have to move fast. So we want to set up a system that is simple as possible to, and, and so does the applicants who they stuck around at night probably because they want to hear about this. So that it's simple, they know, well, we talked about this during the general plan, predictable outcomes. We want to set up predictable outcomes. Do this, you're going to get approval. Don't do this, you got some problems, but but that, that's, in general, is my con I, I feel like that w if you do a thousand feet, almost everything's gonna end up coming to planning commission um, and you're not gonna have anything going to the staff level. Not so, necessary though, the city of West Covina is quite large. So even well, with a thousand feet, I mean, how many cell tower are we expecting to put? So aesthetically, when you integrate it in an area, it might be quite, quite a bit to the eyes of the residents. You, you have an example so, of what we're talking about here tonight, and I believe all those, all five of them were within a thousand feet of each other. So if that's the kind of thing that you're gonna have coming, then they're all gonna come here. That's my point, and you can talk to the applicants about that, because they're, like I said, they're more practically minded than I am. I'm just reading between the lines of what's coming. But these are not cell towers. They're not, I understand that. I completely understand that. But also at the same time as planning commissioners here, we are also setting a standard for our city as well, aesthetically. That's why we're here and that's why we're setting the code. Um, obviously, if we're not here, they're free to do what it is that they wanted to do. So that, you know, as planning commissioners, we also have to look at residents and see how many of this and how many, every other homes, do we want to allow this or do we agree on a number and say, hey, a thousand feet, and if anything closer, it can come to planning commission. So that's the set of standards and the aesthetics that we're going after as well. So what I would suggest is uh, let's, let's hear the rest of the staff report, and then we'll come back to this discussion because you want to hear from the public as well before you, you make some, any Let me just say one thing real quick. I mean, we're really more, it's the, the, like you were saying, it's the design of the pole more than, I mean, is that what we're talking about? Is if, if the design of the pole is, is and we talked about this earlier, is pleasing and acceptable, then, you know, I, I it, it's, again, it's replacing a light pole. You know, you're not putting up this monstrosity that's, you know, ugly necessarily. If you come up with a good design, then it just becomes part of the neighborhood just like a light pole is. And you know. that's, I mean, obviously people are going to have different perceptions. That's why you have five people on yeah, the planning commission. Yeah, exactly. So and and it, once we establish guidelines, then if an applicant comes in and is meets the guidelines, then it doesn't come here, correct? That's what we're trying to do, is trying to come up with guidelines that are, you know, amenable, that aren't going to be, you know, uh, punitive and just, you know, yeah, yeah, I keep going back to my concern. We're talking about uh, T-Mobile right now, and you say 100 feet, 1,000 feet, or whatever it is. What about the other uh, carriers that want to come in and do the same thing? That, like the first sentence says, could allow one telecommunication provider to prevent other market engines from operating in the area. Uh, there's going to be others coming forward with the same thing or the same type of technology. And if you set these parameters, let's say it's 1,000 feet, where is that other, <clears throat> or is that other carrier going to go? Can we? Is the answer well, to that because they can't be, be a thousand feet apart? Right. Can we have as part of the guidelines a a co-location component? 
we, we can certainly, um, we, we can include language to, we can guide them towards co-location. Uh, what we could do is we can make it more difficult for them if they don't co-locate. And we say it's, you know, you make it easier to co-locate, we reduce your requirements if you co-locate, and, and frankly, they already want to co-locate because if you co-locate, they already get ministerial approval anyway. So that's not really too much of a hurdle for them anyway. So I'm, as much as I'm saying, yes, we can do that, the reality is there's not much we can do to incentivize that. Um, but you can't make the existing uh, uh, carrier do that. Correct, because what if their competitor doesn't want to allow right. them to co-locate? Co exactly. um, mm. If I may, one, I think my greatest concern with the 1,000-foot proposal is not, uh, it would mean, number one, everything would be coming to the Planning Commission, because in almost every instance, you're going to have something somewhere going to be within 1,000 feet. Uh, if, if you reduce the size, then you have less items coming to the, the Planning Commission, the, the sole legal concern that I have relates to uh, there is a requirement that there be a ministerial process to allow facilities to be approved. And if, for example, to, to, to make my point, if we said you have to be one million miles away from any other wireless facility, all you have to do is go to the Planning Commission. That would mean, essentially, you would always have to go to the Planning Commission. So it's clear that at some point, if the distance is too great, then we're not really complying with federal law. So the smaller the distance, the more likely we are complying with federal law. The greater the distance, the more the legal risk. But also at the same time as planning commissioners, we do not want to see, at least I don't want to see, every other home or every home in front of the South Tower, let's say AT&T, Verizon, there, let's say 10 South Tower Company, or cell companies that wants to line up their small cell in front and exchange out this um, telephone pole. So when you drive down the street, every other one would have one of these poles. So that aesthetically, it wouldn't look pleasing. I'd rather see once in every few blocks versus one in every other home. That's something that we also need to be concerned about as well. Aesthetically, how does it look in our neighborhood? Not only that, because we don't want them to come to planning commission, that's why there is an issue. If we set 1,000 feet, we can say, okay, if you want it within, if you want to line up 10 of them, let us take a look at it and see, will that look nice? Does the resident want it? Or it doesn't look nice at all? I'll go, I'll go back to, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeff's original statement when he said when he first started out with this, you know, if he'd have known today what he did when he first started out, this is where we're at with this thing. Uh, let's say they, they co-locate. What the hell is that going to look like? You're going to have six or seven of those blocks up on the, on the thing. They're not going to use the same uh, cabinet. So now you're going to have multiple cabinets. So it's not an easy, it's not an easy answer. It's not a quick fix. Uh, so Actually, um, City Attorney, I have a quick question, though. You had mentioned that the Supreme Court had passed a law. Can you explain to me what that is sometime in May or April? April? Okay. Uh, what, what exactly does that do, and what can our city do to protect the residents or aesthetically yes. to make it more pleasing? So uh, two items. I'll answer your question, then I, I have a comment. Uh, so the California Supreme Court issued a ruling confirming that cities do indeed have the right to regulate the aesthetics of wireless facilities in the right of way. Telecommunication providers had been making the argument that I had been denying for years and had been advising my clients that telecommunication companies were wrong and the Supreme Court agreed with me on a 7-0 basis that actually cities do have the authority to regulate the appearance of, our, of, of facilities in the right of way. So, in other words, nothing changed. We still have the ability to consider exactly this ordinance that we're proposing. Okay, so 1,000 feet is within our, our decisions if we, all five of us, decided this is what we wanted to do. 
Correct. I, per, I'm not per, saying per, that so number is a, a, a concrete number, but I'm just correct. saying right. that so is something that we can correct. ultimately correct. decide on what's good for our city, what's good for the resident. Is that what the... Per, per, so that, that's the California Supreme Court that said that. Correct. And it's important that we also remind federal law, that's what I was talking about, that's the distance requirements. That's where I was talking about the greater the distance, the more risk we have. Uh, to your point, what I'm hearing your concerns on the thousand foot is that you don't want to see all of them lined up on the same street. So maybe a potential solution would be uh, that you have a distance requirement and maybe couple that with them being on the same street. So if, for example, it's within, say, a thousand feet, but it's the next street over and they're not within eye shot, then maybe that addresses your concern. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. We have more fun to have, so um, why don't we let Joanne, and we can always come back, but I think this is really question and answer, not discussion on what we wanna do, because you wanna hear from the public before you, you get to that point. So why don't we let Joanne finish up, and then we'll go on from here. Another, um question that the Planning Commission posed was um, the re residential separation. Um, how far can a small wireless facility be from residential property? Um, in staff's opinion, it's maybe prob problematic because it largely prohibits small wireless facilities from being installed in residential areas. If, if, a, if a hard number was, was stated that if a large number was stated that, for instance, what we have right now is 100 feet from, from residential. So in us saying that it has to be 100 feet from residential properties, that essentially prohibits um, small wireless facilities from being located in residential properties. Uh, staff recommends identifying a reasonable distance from a primary residence as a threshold which trips um, discretionary planning commission review. Um, one of the recommendations that staff has is to have it depending on the zone. Um, for instance, in the PCD1, the, the required front yard setback is 10 feet. Um, so in the PCD1 area, the, the distance that would trip a planning commission review is 15 feet from, from residential stru um, structures or single fam residential primary structures. Um, and in uh, all other zoning districts, the front yard setback is about 25 feet. So it would be 30 feet um, it, from residential, primary residential structures. So this, pr this would pr provide five more than the required front yard setback, which would account for the, the, pub the distance from the property line to wh wherever it's gonna be located in the public right of way. Um, if the Planning Commission has any questions or, or um, thoughts on this issue, I would welcome it. Any questions, any thoughts? Hearing none, we'll move on. Okay. Um, the residential separation and the separation in between um, small wireless facilities were the main questions that the Planning Commission had at the last study session. Um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission review the information in the staff report and attachments and also take public comments and provide appropriate direction to staff regarding the code amendment. Um, once the Planning Commission prov uh, it provides direction to staff regarding the code amendment, the Planning Commission may direct staff to to um, go forth with the with the code amendment, and so staff will go ahead and notice it as a public hearing, and the code amendment will be reviewed by the planning commission. And after the planning commission takes action on the code amendment, it would be reviewed by the city council as a public hearing as well. With this, staff uh, concludes st the staff report. If the planning commission has any other questions, um, I'm available to answer. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Public, anybody want to speak on this? Please come on forward, sir. The mic is waiting for you up there. 
Please state your name again, if you would. Uh, Robert Dyson. I'm blanking on my title. So funny, last time, the time I came up here, I did the same thing. I was like, what, you know, what do you, what do you do? Government relations manager for Crown Castle. Uh, one thing I just, uh, a little, maybe a little bit more about Crown Castle, a little correction on something that I said earlier. Um, in, in one of the counties that I'm working in, we've, we're under contract to deploy 1,000 nodes and we've deployed about 450. In Southern California, we are already over 10,000 nodes. We've, already, we've gone through about four different phases depending on different carriers. Crown Castle actually does work for all four major carriers. So we've done Verizon, AT&T, um, Sprint, and, and T-Mobile. So there's, there's, and so those are the beginning waves of this. And, you know, and there's no question that this technology, I mean, it's called small cell for a reason because it really only propagates a certain amount of feet, which means that if you force these sites to be too far from each other, then they won't hand off effectively. Now they can work on their own. If you're in the middle of it, it's like having a Wi-Fi. So you can have a laptop or maybe your phone will work in that area. But as you move, then you're gonna experience the same kind of problems that you would when we, you know, old macro sites were too far apart from each other. So that's an issue on the separation to, to be thinking about the fact that, you know, it's, it's 160 meters roughly propagation for these small cells, which is about 500 feet. So if you're going to have a network of them, and they are supplementing, but they don't replace the macro, but the macro can't do high-speed, super high-speed data that's like, you know, 5G level data. That's what's happening with these sites. They're, we're densifying, that's the word, right? And we're using existing verticals because, you know, cities prefer that we use, uh, that we use existing verticals. And you are right. There's no question. The Supreme Court has confirmed it. You have authority over the aesthetics of your town, but you need to exercise that in a manner that's reasonable. And if the way you set up your design guidelines prevents the network from working effectively, you have autonomous vehicles, you know, you have all kinds of devices that are now going to be used, right? Then, then, it, then you're, then you're not really complying with the law because you have to exercise your aesthetic authority in a manner that, that is reasonable and is consistent with what the network requires. Now, I mean, obviously we can come and have RF engineers talk more about everything. Um, I, you know, I think it, there, I've been around for a little while. I've seen kind of what's happened as well. And I remember cities asking way back when, uh, we want, <laughs> we, you know, why can't you make this smaller, right? So now we're making it smaller. I mean, and it serves a very specific purpose and it's an important purpose, but we're making it smaller and we are actually running into some cities that say, why can't you get rid of these and replace all those with a bigger one, right? It goes back and forth. And, and, and you know, there's, there's anxiety. Um, I am confident the anxiety is gonna dissipate. I, I get that. There's no question about that. Um, on the, on the um, separation from, from structures, um, I think I th if I, I think what you meant was that you're just talking about residential zones, right? You're not talking about other kinds of zones. We mm -hmm. talk about residential. Separation. So the only risk with a, 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 that kind of a of a setback um, is that you're not going to have any existing verticals that meet that requirement in a given location. So if it's too much, then you're going to have you're going to have companies like ours coming to you asking to put a new pole in the sidewalk in a certain area that actually does meet the separation requirements. And, and we're gonna say it's necessary because we can't meet your separation requirements otherwise. So you'll kind of have that conundrum, which may be something you may be willing to work with or may not. Some cities are okay with new poles, other cities don't wanna see new poles. Um, you know, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have about technology to the extent that I have the capability of answering it, yeah, sure. Is, uh, is uh, 250 feet your standard, is that standard throughout the industry? It's, um, there are jurisdictions that have used separation requirements to do this, to minimize the number of sites. Inevitably, you will have a dispute because you will have air, I'm, I'm answering your question, but inevitably you will have a dispute. 250 feet between the same carrier from I, like if you know if I install for T-Mobile here and then I have I can't go any closer than 250 feet for the other T-Mobile node, probably okay 
because I'm prop it depends which way I'm propagating and it depends what I'm trying to cover. Like the antennas that we you know, propose today, right? they're directional antennas. They're not omnis, they don't go everywhere. They only go in the direction that the antennas, because inside, inside the radome, is a, they're flat boxes with flat antennas. So they're propagating in one direction and the, the direction they're propagating is down the street, right? But that also means that if you stand on this side, you're not getting that, which is why the two on the bottom were right next to each other because you were propagating to this and then going forward like that, right? So, so for a single carrier, 250 feet may work, may work, you know. Again, one goes this way, this one goes this way, they don't, you know, right? And, and they're covering two different needs, so there could be a problem there. But you bring in additional carriers and you say, you know, that carrier may need to serve, you know, an area. I mean, if you have a, a shopping center or, you, well, this is resident, re, this is just residential, the 250. So, so you have MDUs, you know, you have high density buildings, you have um, large numbers of families, you know, with phones that need to work and, 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 and carriers want to provide service to that area because of how dense it is, right? And yet 250 feet means you have one node and then you got to go a block away or whatever. Um, I mean, the other street is a thought, but again, you still have some of those problems. So I, I you know, I, I'm not going to say that, sure, it's fine, it's okay. I, I think, I, I, you know, we would work with it, right? We would figure out a way to work with it. And if it came here, if we had to come here, you know, then we would explain why we needed the site that we needed. But, um, but, 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 but when it comes to RF engineering, separation distances can, they can cause havoc. They, they make it difficult to, to um, design. So what is your recommendation? So, yeah, I, 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 well, you confused me because you, you said 1,000 feet is no good and now 250 is no good. Well, so so what, what, is, what do you recommend, 500 feet? Uh, well, candidly, uh, candidly, I think, um, I think you need to begin to look at these designs as designs that are like street lights, right? You may not have a node on every single street light, but, but 10 years from now, it would not be uncommon to have areas where you have nodes on every other street light. We're, we're talking about the deployment, you know, we've deployed maybe 100,000 small cells across the country right now. We're going to be deploying in excess of a million, and that's for 5G. I mean, and, and it shouldn't scare you because it's a design. You got you get you get used to the design, I, right? I, 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 uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a thing of the future, you know, and I I, I completely understand that. Um, but uh, aesthetics is. Uh, uh, let me put it to you this way. So when you sit in your backyard and you look up at the telephone pole. You see this big gigantic transformer, and you know that looks like crap. And 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 so the residents, they need something that they can look at it and it just goes right by them. They don't even think about it. They just, they know it's, it's like it hides in in plain sight. Understood. You know, if I can just say one thing, we we lived, those of us of a certain age, lived for years with those big ugly brown telephone poles, and wires running up and down all over your street, everywhere, until, you know, we finally went to undergrounding. No. Not all of them, but, you know, I mean, when, when I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and those poles were everywhere with just wires and poles, it seemed like they were every few feet. You know, you had these big, ugly telephone poles and covered in grease, and they were just disgusting. You know, we just, that was the, the price you paid for the te technology of that era. You know, so this is a new era, new technology. You know, like you say, well, gee, can't you put it in a, you know, get rid of those little boxes and put it in a big box? You know, we used to say, well, why is that box so big? Can't you do a smaller box? You know, I mean, you can just go nuts. So, you know, I mean, it's residents or customers, consumers want and expect a certain level of service and a certain quality of service. And it, it, it doesn't happen you know, in a vacuum. You've got to have the, the support system in place to make it work. And, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what we're dealing with, that we're going to, you know, we need to do what we can to 
you know, again, make it pleasing, make it aesthetically acceptable, and so forth. And that's, that's the whole point. It, it's, you know, if we were sitting here talking about big, ugly, brown telephone poles, I mean, whoa, that's tough. These are replacing existing light poles with something that looks like the pole they're taking out, except with the shroud on top. You know, and by golly, their laptop's going to work, their wireless is going to work, their phone's going to work, their smart TV, everything's going to work. You know, that's, that's part of what we have to consider also. And like, you know, we're talking about not today, not tomorrow, but years down the line. That's what we're talking about. We, we just, if I may, um, there are a number of, of jurisdictions that are approaching us because there are areas where kids can't do their homework at home because they don't have access. And this is a technology that creates the possibility of doing something like that without being invasive with poles and wires. You can find a way to get the internet you know, as close to them as possible so they don't have to go to the local library or go to the local school. I mean, there's, and that's, that's, you know, that's not a, a dramatic statement. It's the fact that that's the case right now. And schools, all schools everywhere, are handing out laptops to kids to do their homework. I guess let's go back to the numbers. Since you are just one company currently, and you do represent other companies, hypothetically, if you wanted, right now you have five. If 10 other companies to say that that area, they need five more of each, so we have 50 in there. How do you think aesthetically that area will look? Well, I think you know, it depends on the design of the nodes. If the design of the nodes is something that you've grown used to, then nobody's even going to notice it. But, but let me just add this, because I know you've re kind of raised the question before. Our business model happens to be co-location. So our desire is actually to take more than one carrier and put it at a given location. Um, we do, we combine Sprint and T-Mobile now in, in a number of different locations. Um, what was approved earlier has the capability of allowing for the combination of a couple of carriers at that location. So what we are doing and what we use is a neutral, it's called a neutral host antenna. So, so the concern that Mr. Holtz raised was earlier was that you would have a lot of different structures at the same location and you wouldn't like the way that looks if you co-located. That's true unless you have the ability to use the same antenna and then you can have radios running up to the same antenna. That's the technology that we're designing and, um, and that we're using. So in the past, in terms of customer, it's known as roaming, basically. You can share some service in that area or wherever they have a, uh, just like 911, if you call 911, you don't have to have a service per se. Any service can pick you up. But well, they're willing to share. The problem, so my so question roaming, is, roaming is, I guess my question sure. is this. As a city, and we have 50 of these in an inundated small area, I just ask you a question. How does the resident, or how do you think the resident would like it? If 10 companies come into that area and each want five to make their system work, they're yeah. total 50 now. Well, so... So wireless is wireless. Theoretically, we're not saying no, that it's actually it. going to happen I, I because it. you but, said but, that every... But I think it's fair to say that wireless has been around now for 40 years, and we're struggling to hang on to four carriers. So I don't think that financially it's feasible to imagine dozens and dozens and dozens of carriers trying to provide service in the same location. Uh, you know, you have So we four. don't really need it, per se. You have four. You have a, it depends what kind of choice you want, but you have four, right? And you've got to find a way to accommodate those four. If we can co-locate, we want to co-locate. That reduces the number of sites. Um, but you do want to, you want to accommodate all four because all of your, you know, your residents, I mean, they don't all have the same carrier, right? They, they have different plans. They like different plans, quality of service, et cetera. I don't, I don't want to go on too much, but. So, the age of technology and blah, 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 eventually there's going to be one on every single light pole, right? Eventually. Uh, yeah. Is that I, just the way of the future, correct? So, I so think the light poles are going to turn into... Well, they'll, what those, they'll probably do yeah. is go to the LEDs, which will probably, instead of having three light poles, like on my, where my mom's street is, 
There's like five light poles and then in the future there'll be three. Right. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Anything else? Thank you, sir. Sure. Very informative. Thank you very much. I'm lost. Where are we at? <laughs> you were opening up to the public to see if, you, yes. if anybody else wants to speak. I think do that and then you can close it. There's two more members of the public. Anybody want, want to speak on this? No? Empty chairs? No? Okay. Public comment part is over. So now it's uh, back to the Planning Commission. To Up till now, you've been asking questions, not making statements, right? And so now it's time to have a discussion and provide us direction. Really, there's two issues we need direction on before we can really draft a, a code amendment. What separation do you want between facilities? Is that a threshold that kicks it into Planning Commission or discretionary view? And then the separation from residential use is the same, the same, same discussion. So we'd be looking for a number on both of those um, to really be able to draft a code amendment. And, and barring my thoughts, I mean, respective of my thoughts that I had before, of course, whatever the Planning Commission decides, whatever the City Council decides after this, really they're the ones that are going to decide. The Planning Commission never provide a recommendation. Is, staff's going to follow that. It's, it, I just want to provide you our, our perception of things, too. So, It, it just would seem to me uh, it would be based on two different things. One, what the need of the, the carrier is, what they need to do in that particular area for getting uh, uh, the service area that they want. And the second thing is what the neighborhood looks like. Uh, you know, you're talking about up by South Hills where the houses are far apart or down in the, in the flats where, you know, the houses are on top of each other. So I don't know how you come up with a number that's going to resolve all this. I, I really don't. Suggestion? Well, back to uh, what Joanne presented, uh, staff's recommendation, correct me if I'm wrong here, Joanne, but the, the separation between facilities, we were suggesting 250? Between 100 to 250. Well, anywhere between there, but I think maybe 250 would be the number that we would su suggest instead of giving you a range, but that it could work anywhere between there, but 250. And that'd be a threshold. Anything over that would not be denied. It would come to the Planning Commission for, di for discussion. And then the, uh, the, um, for the separation from residential, it's 15 feet in the PCD1 and 30 feet in, in the, in the, in the uh, rest of the residential wow. zone, simply because that makes, if the house is up at the front setback, that makes sure it can't be right in front of the house, that it has to be off center from the house. So that's the logic there. It's maybe not completely sound, but that, that's our logic. Both of them would be thresholds that if it was, if it was yeah. less than that, it would come to the Planning Commission for review. Well, just from my seat, I am comfortable with the 250 as recommended by staff, and I'm also comfortable with the uh, 20, 25 feet for the residential. 15, uh, 15, 15 30, 30, whatever, 15, 15, 30, 30, yeah. yeah. So because I want to make it as simple for applicants to come forward so they know what the what the regs are what they need to present and if we can bring these in and and turn them around quickly and i don't want to force every single applicant to come to the planning commission there is that threshold if they if they can't meet those guidelines then it will come to the planning commission is that correct that's correct yeah so, you know, we want to be able to, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's like Commissioner Kelly was saying, it's light poles, one in, one out. And, you know, I think that the, the residents, the neighborhood, these are the people that have the cell phones. These are the people that have all the devices. These are the people that you have cell phone carriers spending multi-millions of dollars every year to advertise to these people. Why? Because they want a quality product, they want good service, they want their cell phone to work, they want their, all their devices to work, and that's, that's a strong selling point. So you know, it's, it's for them that all this is being done. It's not for us. I mean, it's for us because we're customers too, but you know, it's for them. So, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with what I just said. Okay. 
I think in this case it's probably better to have a motion. We don't it's always a motion. Do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there is no easy answer to anything that comes to us most of the time. But, you know, uh, that's a motion. We have a motion and a second, correct? Okay. Discussion on the motion? Commissioner Hawkhead. Uh, just more or less a, a comment about um, something that just came to light you know, as, a, as a matter of the questions that just occurred, you know, with uh, Commissioner Kennedy asking um, uh, some very uh, interesting questions that, that made it more clear to me uh, and about, you know, the issue of co-location um, and that if, you know, with Crown Castle's business model being that that's what they're looking for, I uh, wish we had actually heard that a little bit earlier, <laughs> but that that, make, that makes a huge difference to, uh, difference to me, uh, knowing that that is going to resolve a lot of uh, the concerns about the propagation of, um, you know, many of the, you know, the small cell sites, that it's going to uh, help to alleviate some of that. Um, and, uh, and quite frankly, I think I've been educated quite a bit about, you know, how this all works and how why co-location is actually beneficial um, for um, in in both directions for the for the consumer for the uh, for the businesses that are going to use it. So um, that makes it much easier to you know look at at a at having a you know the, a, a a minimum distance threshold of 250 feet. It, it makes it a much easier decision for me. And let me just make one follow-up. I think most businesses that are in the same business as this company, they realize that cities are going to look far more favorably on a company that's part of their business plan is co-location. Yeah. You know, if you walk in there and say, I don't co-locate, well, there's the door, dude. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, that's the way it's going to be. So they're not going to be the only one. They all want to co-locate. Like he said, we're down to four. You know, we've got four carriers that are really the ones driving the train here, you know. So th it's, it's, it's the way to go. It's the only way to do it is the co-location. That's their business plan. That's probably all of their plans. Like I say, if they're not, if they don't, not on board with that, then, you know, ta-ta. Right. Next city, you better be pushed that harder. Yeah, exactly. And good luck with that. Any other, we have a motion and a second. Is there any other comment? Hearing none, let's have a roll call, please. Just to be clear, this motion is to provide direction to us to what to prepare. It's not, yeah, exactly. you're not approving it. You, yes. You're going to have a resolution come back before you to a public hearing, and you can, you can completely have further discussion because of additional information you may yes. receive between now and then. Okay, uh, Commissioner Holtz. I just don't have enough information to make a, a good judgment that I feel comfortable with, so I'll say no right now. Okay. Commissioner Hing. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, as planning commissioners, we are making decisions for the futures and for all the residents in the futures. So I'm erring on the fact that we should be more cautious and more conservative in terms of putting the numbers out there. And I think more distance would be preferable. So I would say no based on that. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Aquez? Yes. And Chairman Reynolds? Aye. Okay. The motion passes three to two for direct, I guess, directional purposes. So what we will be doing now is we, we have enough, we have enough information to put together a, an ordinance and bring it back to you. We tentatively have that scheduled for, I think, August 27th, right? Second meeting in August. Yeah, August 27th. Um, when we're ever drafting a code amendment, it doesn't always go as smoothly. So we're going to try to meet that date, but, uh, um, don't set your clock by that. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get there, but if we have some hangups and we need some works with the city attorney, we may need a little more time. Um, but that concludes that. Okay, no worries. We're on number seven now, which is a study session, code amendment number 19-02, concerning R1 rear setbacks and AHQ standards. Thank you very much for coming back, folks. Appreciate it. Mr. Anderson. Yes.
one second. Oops. All right, so this is a code amendment uh, 1902 so our, for R1 standards. On April 2nd, 2019, the City Council initiated Code Amendment 1902 to consider revisions to rear yard setbacks and accessory habitable quarters in single family zones. The Code Amendment was initiated at the conclusion of a Code Amendment 1802 regarding city standards for accessory dwelling units, which we also call ADUs. At the Council hearing on that item, there was discussion that the accessory dwelling unit standards should be consistent with the standards for addition, additions to houses. And you may remember at the Planning Commission, those of you who were on at the time, we also had similar discussions at that time, actually a couple different hearings over the last couple of years. While adopting that code amendment, the council discussed that rear setback standards should be evaluated as well as standards for accessory habitable quarters, which we formerly called guest houses. The city current, so I'm gonna talk about rear setbacks first. The city currently has a 25 foot rear setback for one story and two story structures. So. It gets confusing from here, but I'll try to be as clear as possible. That's our setback. But someone had a great idea sometime, probably 30, 40 years ago in West Covina, um, to allow an exception to this setback for one-story structures that encroach no more than 40% into the rear yard that have a minimum five-foot setback. So in practice, what that means is that the rear setback is actually five foot. In effect, the code does allow structure to be built with a five foot rear setback that are one story structures. It is possible that the initial concept for allowing the five foot setback was for non-habitable buildings. However, the code allows all structures that are one story to be built with a five foot setback. I bring that out because I, we, we did a survey in its attachment three before you and I've worked at other cities that you had different setbacks for habitable and, and unhabitable. So in other words, a garage could be a five foot setback, but a, a room addition generally was, a, most cities that I've worked for is a 20, 25 feet. So that's why I bring it up. I don't really have any, I have no crystal ball to know why or who or what the circumstance that brought this about in West Covina to put it in the code, thus that it is. For most lots in the city, it is not likely that a room addition will be built with a five foot rear setback. So if you think about lots that you live in or are familiar with, you probably recognize that you're not anywhere near the five foot setback. In addition, that close to the rear property line can impact neighboring rear yards. The reason that doesn't happen is because that lots are usually big and that would be a giant addition that would go all the way back and then you'd have to leave 40% of it open and most people don't want an addition that goes back 30, 40, 50 feet from the rest of their house. They, they want it to be part of the house and incorporated into the house. So recent changes to state law make it difficult to have different regulations for room additions and ADUs. In practice, many individuals proposing ADUs are proposing them as close to the rear yard as possible, which causes concerns for privacy in the neighboring rear yards. It should also be noted that state law requires cities to allow legal structures to be converted, habitable or non-habitable, into ADUs. So when I say practical, I'm, talking, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cause, I'm not talking about anybody that's ever talked to the Planning Commission before, I'm not talking about anybody in particular, I'm talking about the t things we talk about at our staff meetings what people are proposing, they are generally proposing those at the rear setback line. We talked about two of them, I think, today that are proposing ADUs at the five-foot setback. I, I don't know the reason why they're doing that. I can, I can suppose why they're doing it, and, uh, but I don't know the reason. But that, it's, it's much more common, and whenever we talk to people about attaching them, they don't want to attach them. So people don't want to attach them, they want to put them as far away from the existing unit as possible. Um, and so also understand that even if we're talking about for a second, we're talking about uh, additional garages or sheds or outbuildings of that type, as soon as they build that and it's legally done, they can turn around and submit an ADU to convert that building, no matter what it is, into an ADU. So the, the situation we have has caused some problems for us in, in thinking about you know, what, what at least what I would consider, and I think most of us would consider a traditional yard arrangement where you have a front yard, a house, and a rear yard. It's really thrown that on its sort of on its ear, and, and so that's why the council, I think, wanted us to, to, to discuss this. So staff surveyed surrounding cities for rear setbacks for habitable and for non-habitable, and again, I have that in your staff reports as attachment number three. Many cities have different standards to allow detached garages, sheds, or other accessory structures in the rear yard. 
given the current requirements for ADUs, it may not be advisable to create different standards for how to, well, if you had asked me this three or four years ago, I might have give you a different answer than I'm giving you today. But today, it probably doesn't make sense to allow habitable to be, I mean, to, to meet a 25 and non-habitable five, because they can turn around the next day after it's finaled and p turn into an ADU. This code amendment was initiated to consider modifications to the five-foot rear setback. The issues to consider are privacy in rear yards and the appropriate location for ADUs. Staff has developed a list of options to allow for discussion, so I'm gonna go through those options. Uh, all options would continue, continue to require a 25-foot rear setback for all two-story structures, so we're not talking about changing that. That would stay in effect. So, and I've also listed here, I won't, go, I won't read them, but I've listed the cities that have these setbacks from the survey that we did. Uh, so number one would be continue to require a rear setback of five foot. So keep the code the same. Number two would be require a rear setback of 10 feet. And there are cities near us that have that requirement. Uh, number three would be require a rear setback of 15 feet, which oddly enough, there are no cities that have that requirement. Um, four would be require a setback of 20 feet, which several cities in our area have that requirement. And then five is require a rear setback of 25 feet and there are several cities that have that. Now, you may look at that and go, well, Jeff's crazy because he's got, he's got the same cities on different ones. Well, that's because they have different setbacks in different areas of the city. So a larger lot might have a bigger setback than a smaller lot size. So in, in our city, the, the houses in the hills might have a larger setback than the houses that are down the street on the north side. So that, that's the concept. That's why it's like that. So in looking at that and realizing we're at five feet now, staff is thinking maybe the, meet, the, the sort of the common ground there is a rear setback of 15 feet as it allows some encroachment into the rear yard, uh, but provides a separation from the neighboring properties on the rear. In other words, if you have a 15 foot setback and you have a window, you're not gonna be now looking into your neighbor's yard at 15 feet. Now you have more visibility of your backyard and a wall or fence that's back there. Um, so that would likely reduce some of the negative impacts. So that's. That's a discussion point there, and I'm gonna go through the whole thing since it's so late, and then we'll come back and hit that. Um, okay, I didn't get this in the right order. I'm gonna skip this and come back, because I wanna talk about AHQs. The city modified the standards for accessory habitable quarters in 2014. So some of you remember that, some of you don't. Accessory habitable quarters are distinct from ADUs in that they are not considered a separate unit. They allow no kitchen facilities, and there are no requirements per state law. So this isn't a state law, this is a situation where the city can do whatever they want. Accessory habitable quarters require the approval of an administrative use permit. They also require these standards, so they require lots of standards. They require parking uh, covered parking spaces and, um, and, and, and some setbacks and separation for windows. While the state has revised the manner that cities can regulate ADUs, it is the city's choice about whether to allow AHQs, what we call, used to call guest houses. And so since 2014, when the, we changed the rules, I didn't go back before this, but I can tell you that before this, we, we, we sometimes had, I think, 20 to 25 guest houses were approved in a year, and we had one ADU. Now it's flopped. So we had, in 20, since 2014, we've had four H. AHQs proposed, one in 2014, two in 2015, and one in 2017. None in 2018 and none so far in 2019. Because the state has placed a focus on ADUs requiring to be approved by right, there's not been an interest in proposing AHQs. The proposed amendment would examine rear setbacks and AHQs. Staff has also suggested, well, now I'll get to the backup space. So that's, that's, that's the situation here. People aren't asking for AHQs because it's so easy to do an ADU. Historically, guest houses were a simple process. I've covered this. Over the last 10 years, the state required, I think I've covered all this. Um, yeah, I think I have. So I'm gonna, let me go back to the backup space. So those are the two things that the council asked us to do. But staff has another thing we'd like to add on to this because we, we deal with R1 standards a lot. There's a lot of people that you can understand that come to the counter asking questions about doing additions. And the further we get into the future, so to speak, the more that the, there's, uh, the, uh, the lot coverage gets higher and the, the, the space on the lot gets less space between structures. So currently the code has some requirements for backup space for garages on a side street, for backup spaces on the front yard, and for minimum driveway length. However, the code does not contain a separation distance from the garage door to another structure. So what we're talking about is the garage is in the back of the property and then there's a house in between it and the, and the, and the street. 
Um, planning currently has a policy requiring 25 foot backup space. However, the municipal code does not include any standards to ensure that vehicles can access a garage. So we're suggesting that we put in the code that there's a 20 foot, 25 foot backup. So we don't end up in what probably most people would consider silly arguments that somehow you can get a car in a garage that only has 10 feet between the garage door and in, in addition to the house. So those are the three things and I'm gonna conclude by going back and saying, because the rear setback is probably the, 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 the two questions, rear setback, what should be the rear setback? Should we keep it the same? Should we change it to something? Staff is suggesting considering 15 feet. And second, is Planning Commission comfortable with just totally eliminating the AHQ standards at all and letting people who want to do that type of thing propose an ADU? So that concludes my thoughts and I'm prepared to answer questions or hear input. Well, I'm all for eliminating the AHQs. I don't think there's a reason to have them anymore since it's all ADUs and ADUs, if they come to us uh, within the guidelines, they're allowed by right. So, a, correct? Yep, yeah. that's correct. And AHQs are, seem to have fallen over, you know, fallen out of favor. So I have no problem with that. I have no problem uh, codifying the 25 feet uh, for the garage backup and I'm fine with a 15 foot rear setback. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Jaquez. Um, yes, I have, a, I have a question. Maybe staff might be able to weigh in on when it comes to um, differing rear setback, setbacks for differing different size lots. And, you know, with West Covina being as large as it is, um, there, there can be a pretty um, distinct and wide variation in the size of lots in different parts of the city. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, if you know, you're thinking about maybe a, a 15 foot setback, um, maybe it maybe it could even be larger for some of the larger lots and, uh, and maybe smaller for some of these really smaller lots, you know, uh, you know, maybe 10 for the smaller and 25 for the larger, but Maybe we can discuss that to see if, because just having one, having this one um, dimension for setback to cover, you know, potential ADUs throughout the city, just doesn't seem reasonable to apply to all size lots. So I, I that's a very good point. Most cities actually have different standards for different size lots. So we we have varying lot sizes from 6,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet. But on the rear setbacks, since there's some differences in setbacks, but in rear setbacks, they're all the same. So it, that could be something, and, and we're, under, we're not, there's not a timeline. We have to get this done by a certain time. So, and, and it's late tonight, I recognize. Maybe one thought is to bring back another study session to talk about the different, uh, and, and, and you know, talk about the different area district sizes and maybe I can think about that a little bit more and provide some input on, on that. Because it is, as I pointed out, with. The chart you see here, there many cities do have that exact scenario. So currently, it's only five feet setback for for one story. That is correct. Now there, it's an exception, so there are rules with that. You can't you can't cover your whole backyard. You can only cover forty percent, and it can only be one story. <laughs> it, it's it's a little odd. I I I don't I don't really understand how that came to be, but. But, that, but it is five feet, yes, and we do have people building things at five feet. Very rarely do we have a housing addition that goes all the way to five feet, but it does happen on smaller lots sometimes. So for one story, they can go five feet from the back? For two story, they have to be 25 feet. I guess I'm okay with the one story. I'm okay with staff's recommendation. Is there a consensus on the commission to eliminate the AHQ? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. We're all in agreement yes. on that? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So that, that's, you, you got a solid on that one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else on this, Jeff? Um, are, are, is everyone in agreement Can on the backup space? Yes. Oh. We're all good on the backup space? Actually, the AHQ eliminating, I mean, 
what's the major difference between the two ADU versus um, accessory dwelling units? Uh, I mean, uh, I know what you're meaning. Yeah, AHQ versus AHQs. an ADU. Uh, an ADU is required to be allowed by state law. You cannot. We couldn't eliminate that, or we'd get we'd lose. Um, and so, and it is a separate unit. So it can have kitchen facilities, and it's defined as a separate unit. And you don't, because of the state law, you don't have allow. You can't require parking. There's all these things you can't require. With an AHQ, there are no standards from the state. It's just a detached room. It's not allowed to have kitchen facilities. Although I think if we went and did a survey, we'd find that many of them do have kitchen facilities. Um, and, and what's the size limit? It's it's, it's 640. 640. Which used to be the size, of, it used to be the same exact as the second unit. Second unit, used, ADUs used to be 640. We increased them to 800 just recently based on state law. So you're saying now resident cannot build a, a space without another kitchen? I'm sorry, ask the question again? Um, hypothetically, let's say if they want to build a little unit, but like a pool home, you don't need oh, another house. kitchen. So that's not allowed? You have to have a kitchen if you built? Well, I'm not, uh, it, from my standpoint, <laughs> Scott may disagree with me on this. Uh, uh, if someone wants an ADU without a kitchen, I, I wouldn't argue that. Now, the next year they could come and ask for one because it's allowed by state law, but if, I'm not gonna force someone to have a kitchen. And if you think about it, do we want to allow people to have a pool house and an ADU? No. And a garage and a, and a, I mean, I think you wanna try to restrict the number of accessories. So you're dwelling. saying that the, the city can't, uh, Potentially allowed a. Yeah, you don't have to have it. Uh, but uh, we can talk about that further. I think. You don't have I, to have a kitchen. Which is that allowed? It's in the definition. Yeah. It may be in the definition. I guess I wouldn't require someone to have it. Yeah. To require someone to do something they don't want to do. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a little difference of opinion we'll, we'll, we'll here. We'll look into that, but yeah. um, okay. my concerns are that if. But if it's a, technically a, it's a dwelling unit, you need to have a kitchen to comply with state health standards. So there's a little bit of difference. Like if someone don't want a kitchen, it may not apply to them because they're being forced to have one because of state. If they have to comply to AD, ADU. Well, so because, let's get to the point. I think oh. you're, I'm not. I'm not sure what you're asking, but I think what you're asking is, what if someone wants a pool house? So, so, that so an AHQ is not a pool house because an AHQ would have a bedroom and then if it has a bedroom, it's required to have a, a, a garage. So it's not quite the same thing as you're picturing. It, it really is, a, it's almost like a second unit that's not really defined as a second unit because it does require a garage. But yeah, it's not required to have a kitchen versus ADU does. Correct. Maybe, to some extent. Right. Clear as mud. Clear as mud, yeah. I guess I would state again, if someone comes in and wants to do an ADU and they don't want a kitchen, I'm not going to go out and inspect to make sure they put in a kitchen. But would that comply to state law then? That wouldn't be up to the city. That would be the, on the person who built it. But at any rate, we're, we're getting into a weird yeah. area of discussion. It really has nothing to do with the AHQ. The AHQ is a, is a detached room that requires, um, that, that, that requires all, uh, all these standards here. Now we can talk about other, ex it, it, we can talk about other accessory buildings that are allowed. And I think that m most other, there are, it, that's not the only accessory building that's allowed. Um, and really it boils down to what you define as habitable, what we define as habitable. We can w work with the code to make sure that things like pool, I can't think of another example besides a pool house um, that you would want to allow someone to have. Um, keep in mind, if they had a pool house, they could, a lot of people won't have kitchens in those too because they're out at the pool and they want to cook. <laughs> workshop. workshop is non-habitable, so it's not an AHQ. Okay. So what we, what, else? <laughs> why don't we do this? We'll come back as, as we presented it. We can have further discussion. We'll, we'll prepare a code amendment. We can have further discussion. We're gonna bring some information back about the different area districts and we can have discussion about whether we wanna have different uh, setbacks for different area districts. And we can have, and we can, we'll also bring back the information on the 
accessory, other accessory units that are allowed and the accessory buildings that are allowed, not units. And then we can try to uh, work through that and make sure that any type of accessory building that you want to make sure is allowed is in the code. Sounds good. Um, all right. So we're going to, should we, do, are we all in agreement that we can carry over the uh, uh, subcommittee guidelines for single stories to another meeting? Yeah. So any of you out there in the audience that came for that, I'm sorry. We're going to uh, <laughs> hold that over till uh, our next meeting or a future meeting. A yeah, boy, they're all disappointed. Okay, so we are at uh, the community development. Oh, any commission comments or reports or miscellaneous items from any commissioner? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll move on to the director's report, Mr. Anderson. We have four, all we really have on that is Get to my is forthcoming. Yeah, that's correct. We have forthcoming. We have items for the August 13th, and we expect to have items for August 27th. Okay. City Council action. I have nothing to report on City Council action. Okay. That has brought us to the end of the agenda. And if there's no objection. Hold on, I have one thing to say. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to close this, this meeting in memory of Phil Coffey. Yeah. Oh. I was going to do that too, come to think of it. No, slam it, please. Okay. We're adjourning in memory of Phil Kaufman, our beloved commissioner who passed away three weeks ago, who's a friend of all of ours. We are adjourned. Thank you, folks.